uh, school year. Hopefully this is a nice way to enter in <laughs> for you um, this morning. We've been planning for this uh, since January, actually, at the beginning of the year. And we are really, really excited to be here with you today virtually and uh, excited to talk to you about a lot of ways that you can connect, hopefully, with us uh, throughout the year. This is not just a one shop or one time PD. It really has a long lasting, hopefully a long lasting uh, purpose. And we, we really want to invite you to be part of this community if you're not already. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and advance our slides here. So um, as you can see, we are offering today the opportunity to get a professional development credit. For those of you that are in the state of Idaho, we've been able to work with our state and um, university administrators to be able to supply folks with um, a free PD credit, but that's not limited to those of you that are out of state. Um, you have the option of paying $60, $60 for one PD credit through Boise State University. All we need you to do is to make sure that you've enrolled or that you've said that you wanted that PD credit. On September 1st, we're going to be communicating with you about how to actually enroll in the Canvas course. A professional development credit needs 15 hours of contact time. And so we have a go at your own pace, asynchronous course set up for you. Like I said, September 1, you'll get that information. And then when you've completed everything, you go ahead and pay if you're out, uh, out of state or if you're a concurrent enrollment uh, instructor or in-state K through 12 secondary um, Idaho teacher, we'll go ahead and, and cover that cost for you. So um, again, last call, please make sure that you're there because today is part of that, of that 15 hours that we're counting. We wanna take the chance and uh, say welcome and introduce our team here. So um, my name is Kelly Arvispe. I'm one of the co-directors, Amber can wave. She's the other co-director here. Hello. <laughs> and we have uh, two lead teachers with us here today as well. Sharon, can you wave? Say hello. And Cindy Cook is also here with Hi, us everyone. as well. <laughs> um, and then uh, last but not least, we also have our OER librarian, Shannon. Can you wave? Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, and so you can recognize our orange background. Our other facilitator, Cindy, um, is, is here. She just doesn't have her background because I'm sure you can all relate to this. Uh, her computer uh, with her district doesn't have permission for her to use her video. So we, we tried to troubleshoot it to no, to no end. That's not her fault, but that's okay. She's here and she's got lots of, uh, of great uh, expertise to offer too. So all of these wonderful, beautiful people are going to be supporting um, the workshop today. And we're really, really excited to kick this off. Um, so who is here today? Who, who are you? Who are the people coming in um, on this Zoom call? As you can see, we have 25 languages represented, which I can't tell you how excited that makes us feel. For a long time, we've been working with um, nine languages at our institution in our department, and we love those languages. We love the people that teach those languages, but we are always looking for ways to expand and champion teachers who are often an island and don't have resources in their language. And so you're gonna to see today, the Pathways Project is exactly the type of project that can support revision, remixing and customization so that you can take a good pedagogical idea and you can run with it and transform it into something that fits your language, the culture you teach, and most importantly serves um, our students. We're also super stoked that there's great representation geographically here today. It's not just um, Idaho. We, we promoted this, uh, this event widely to our, pathways, um, to our Pathways community. We have a newsletter that now has over a thousand subscribers. And so we're very, very pleased to see that so many of you took the chance to be here with us today. So thank you for being here. On this next slide, you can see I've taken a quote. Some of you got an email over the summer, those that were checking email and you participated. Thank you very much for participating in a survey. Um, we're going to explain a little bit more about how this workshop is situated within a, a larger grant project in a couple minutes. But on that survey, Amber and I were looking at some of the results and some of the comments from people who maybe are part of our community, um, but haven't really dappled a lot in OER. And we found this quote and we thought that this was a really great way to start. I'm going to go ahead and read it and you can read along with me. 
This person said, I simply need to devote more time to familiarizing myself with where to find OER materials suitable for the courses I teach. Things have been so busy since COVID began that I haven't found the time I need to truly immerse myself in the possibilities that I know are present and that I failed to tap into. I have a very strong hunch that the more I delve into OER searching and using, the easier and faster and less daunting it'll be, the process will be for me. And that's exactly the spirit of today. We want to give you the time. You deserve the time um, to be able to delve into this work. There is so much work out there for you to use. We know teachers, the, the biggest commodity that teachers value is time, but we also know you really care about quality and you want your students to engage in meaningful ways. And so we're, we're, we have the chance to be here today to show you all of the resources that are out there, but not just to dump resources at you, but to actually give you strategic working time so that you can put those, those resources to use in your own activities. And before we begin in the four different parts, we'll talk to you about the agenda for today's uh, program for our workshop. We really wanna center our time today on core values. These are core values for the Pathways Project team and they're guiding principles that we hope will be dispositional as we talk and engage today in this workshop. Once I'm done reading them, I'm gonna ask that everybody either give a, an actual thumbs up or give a thumbs up um, on the bar there that you can see below in your Zoom call, indicating that you're in agreement that these are gonna be, this is gonna help set the tone for the ways that we engage. So first and foremost, this is an active, very active and open and diverse community. And we celebrate that um, everything that we create is open. That means that it's freely accessible to you. We're going to, in fact, there should be a quiz on this later because that's kind of the heart of, of the first section is making sure you know what that actually means because that can mean a lot of different things. So we're going to get into that. The second is that we we really encourage everyone that that's including the, the, the facilitation team here today. Everyone is an involved learner. We're constantly relearning and thinking about new ways to do um, the good work of teaching and teaching languages specifically. Um, the third one is that we really prioritize process over product. I know sometimes as teachers, it can feel like we've got to get everything perfect and it has to be just right. But the reality is we need to work together in a community and support um, the harder work, which is to sit in the messiness of the creative process and be okay with that process taking some time. And so we're going to talk to you later about how you can actually um, submit something that maybe is a little half-baked or needs some, some refining. And we have an actual team of OER editors and content experts that can take your expertise in the classroom and the work that you have cultivated in an activity, for example, and put some refining touches on it. We know that this often takes uh, teachers a long, um, it, it takes them a little bit longer and sometimes they don't have that time. And so we wanna partner with you and we'll show you how you can do that today. So we can get your good work out there too. We wanna make sure that everybody knows that this is a place where we wanna be kind and constructive, not critical. It takes a lot of courage to share um, our work, our collective work. We know sometimes that maybe some ideas are better than others, that's normal. Um, it's normal that some ideas are going to fall better to you than maybe others will, um, and that's okay, but we always want to um, espouse a kind and constructive environment. Number five is really important. You can say it out loud with me with mute on. Thou shalt not reinvent the wheel. It's very, very important. Um, we are, we have, we have very limited time. There are excellent resources out there, and we want to point you to those resources, though, that you don't have to start from scratch. That's the whole goal. And then finally, what's most important to this team today is we are absolutely committed to diverse, elevating diverse voices and perspectives. We hope that you see in the activities that we create, the websites that we are showing you and directing you to, and the ways we're thinking about implementing these activities in the classroom allow for greater diverse representation because our students um, need to see themselves in that. And we're gonna talk about how that actually impacts uh, learning as well. I know you all know this, but it's really important to say, these are, our, these are our core values. So if you can, give me a thumbs up and we'll proceed. Awesome. Great, thank you. When we talk about being committed to diverse um, perspectives, 
there's actually a lot of research in OER that talks about this um, from a social justice lens. I'm not going to take the time to read over this, but we recognize that this presentation, I want to let you know that this presentation will be accessible to you afterwards. And so you might want to come back here. You might want to be able to, to read up on this, or these might be um, important characteristics of this work that really resonates with your core value as an educator as well. All right, so where are we headed today? What's the agenda? What's on the agenda? This is, first and foremost, there will be breaks, there will be a lunch break, and there will be raffles. So for a free stuff, we're going to try to make it as engaging and fun for you as possible. We recognize that a virtual workshop um, has its has its ups and downs. We're going to try to encourage you to, to, to stand up when you need to, if you want to, to do some stretches from your chair, whatever, whatever helps benefit you and your own self-care is absolutely fine. We, of course, love to see your faces on video. Um, when that's not appropriate for you, we also respect your autonomy to take it off. We do ask, however, that when we um, engage in breakout room discussions, to the extent possible, you keep your video on. It's just a nice way for us to, to know with whom we're talking and to be able to feel a little bit more seen and heard. Um, in terms of the four parts for today, the first three are gonna be before lunch and the fourth is kind of like a mega part that we're gonna do after lunch. The first part, I'm gonna be talking to you about giving you an introduction to OER. And we're hopeful that that introduction will be uh, both uh, profound for those who maybe know a little bit about OER, so there'll be some new things there, but it also won't be too uh, too overwhelming for those that are, are brand new. We, we recognize that everybody here is in a different place in the continuum, and, and you're welcome. Um, the second part, Amber's going to talk to you specifically about the Pathways Project. I know many of you in Idaho have heard about this, but you probably haven't had as much time to get in there and see what we've been doing for the last year. We've made a lot of updates, and we have uh, over 800 activities in there ready for you to use. And so she's going to be giving you a really nice orientation and providing time for you to actually go in there and, and see what, what activities are there and to be able to think specifically about how you can take one of those activities and use it in your classroom. The third part, as I just alluded to, is going to be giving you time to actually revise. So we're going to be engaging you in a cycle, an OER cycle that has um, five R's. We're going to be talking to you about that in just in just a few minutes, but those five R's are really important, and that's the way we've centered this entire workshop. So in that third part, you're going to be revising one of our activities, and we are excited to see your revisions. We know that you are going to be able to take that activity and make it much better, and we're we're hoping, we're, we're counting on that. So roll up your sleeves, get ready, it'll be great. Then we'll have a lunch, we'll come back, we'll, we'll raffle off two gift, uh, gift certificates to a bookstore, online bookstore, and then we'll get started with our... Um, then we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, fourth section, which will uh, have to do with specifically the digital humanities and authentic resources. And at that time, we're going to share with you a repository that we've been curating for the last four or five months that is specifically bringing together all the authentic resources and digital humanities sites that we think are gonna be most helpful for world language teachers. So sometimes you go online and you see things that are, that cover or, or span lots of content areas and you have to do the hard work of, of going through there and figuring out if it's right for you. Well, we've done that and we're gonna share it with you and give you the chance to explore it. So what are the learning outcomes for today? First and foremost, you'll be able to define, you're gonna identify and you'll be able to locate OER and digital humanities materials specific to world language teaching and learning. I don't know if you feel like me, but I know that there are so many opportunities for professional development that aren't specific to world language teaching. We all have to sit through a lot of professional development general uh, you know, sessions and they're helpful, but they're only so helpful. It's really, really special and unique to be able to have something that's centered on being a world language teacher. And so that's the goal here today is that everything that we do with OER and digital humanities directly impacts you as a language teacher. We're gonna give you the time. Again, this is not a webinar, this is a workshop. We have built in time for you to be able to practice um, that cycle of retaining, reusing, revising, remixing. 
And then we're going to give you the chance to customize one of the activities specifically. And then the goal is that at the end of the day, you'll feel part of this community. You'll get to know some folks, hopefully across, across the, the U.S. or even the globe. Um, and that you'll feel part of the Pathways community because it is a community. And to that end, as a community, don't we all wish gas prices reflected this right now? Um, we are going to ask, we are going to remind you that this workshop is free. We're going to remind you that all of our materials are free. And the kindest thing that you can do for us is to give us your honest feedback. Um, at the end of the day today, around 2.30, we're going to actually have a slide that says, check your email. And at that time, you will be emailed a link to a survey. I'm going to show you in just a second why that survey matters, but I'm going to beg that you take the time to do that. Even if you, if some of you I know might not be able to stay for the entirety of today, um, we're going to ask that you still fill that survey out. It really, really matters to us. And that that's a way of thanking us for our time and the work that's um, been devoted here for the, for the workshop. Uh, and then also I forgot to mention at every part, we're going to ask you to just quickly sign in. We have a Google form we'll share with you. Just type your name and your email. That's specifically important for people who um, are wanting PD credit, but it also is just another mechanism by which we can say, see, all these people showed up. They find this a value. Give us more money. To that end, we're super thankful for the NEH. Um, the NEH, uh, specifically the Office of Digital Humanities, has given us um, a, a really, really important uh, grant to be able to do this work. We received this uh, grant back in January, and we are on a two-year cycle for this um, important work, which is to evaluate teacher practices using OER. And so this is actually the kickoff event for that. I hope that makes you feel excited. Um, we have been looking forward to it for a long time, and we're really grateful for all that the NEH does to support um, teaching and learning, and specifically by making all of their resources open, which is really, really important. All right, so there are going, we're just about to, to step into the, the first part. This is our introduction here today, but we want to make sure that you have two links open at all times. One of the biggest barriers with the online workshop is that we'll be throwing lots of links at you and it's really easy to get lost. Some of you might be expert bookmarkers. That's fantastic. If you are, go ahead and you want to bookmark the two. There, there's going to be three links. The first is to a document that you can save. If bookmarking is new for you, you might take this approach. Okay, so you might just say, I'm just going to keep this document and come back to it and worry about bookmarks later. No problem. If that's you, if you're the first person who's feeling like, eh, I'm overwhelmed with that, that's fine. Just make sure that the second and third link that I shared with you in the chat, that you keep those ones open, okay? So you might pull those out or um, find a way to just make sure that they're, they're always open and accessible for you because they're going to be instrumental in the parts of today where you're actually um, workshopping or strategically working on an, on an activity. All right. So without further ado, are we all good? All right, fantastic. So we're gonna go ahead and start with our first session here. And here we go. So I'm gonna ask, please, if you have, this is a two question survey. So if you have a phone, it might be easier for you just to open your camera app and put it at the screen. And this big QR reader will immediately take you to a survey where you just write your name and your email. If you can do that for us before we begin, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, and Shannon has just also put it in the chat too. So there's multiple ways for signing in. All right, great. So we're going to start with a little bit of a warm up and I'm uh, throughout this workshop we're hopeful that uh, you'll see a kind of a meta approach here too, where we're modeling strategies for engagement that are probably really familiar to all of you and nonetheless maybe they'll be in a, in a with a different flavor and hopefully that'll be helpful to you as you're thinking about your own classroom. So this is an approach it's called the logographic clues and it's really helpful when you're introducing a new concept or you're introducing a new text and so i'm going to give you actually uh, 20 seconds here to i'm going to give you 20 seconds here, let me turn it on okay. You got 20 seconds to try to come up with 
an idea about how these, these images connect. What's the connection here? All right, any guesses? Urban life, movement, unsplashed. Yeah, <laughs> unsplashed is uh, one of our favorite sites that we'll be showing you later. Cooking food, culture. All right, so all of these images for, for me when I was thinking about learning, um, connect with this idea of learning by doing, right? I don't know how many of you have tried to learn playing the guitar by just watching someone playing guitar. It does not go well. Same can be said for, for soccer. So many soccer fans that know all about soccer until they actually try to play, right? And so um, really what we want to communicate here to start off is that OER and the, the process of revising and finding and remixing activities is professional development. And we know that we need to do a better job of helping communicate that to administrators. They need to know that when you're creating activities and you're sharing them with other educators, you are engaging in strategic professional development. And so, oops, sorry, I skipped over a slide, there we go. And so the goal for this session specifically is that you can, at the end of, at the end of this first part, that you'll be able to explain to a colleague what open profession, open educational resources actually are on your own terms, right? And then secondly, that you would be able to give an example of, of a couple OERs. And you can see here, I'm using Actful's language of the can-do statements to make them teacher can-do statements, right? So these are things that we hope that all teachers will be able to do at the end of this uh, first part. All right, so let's go to open educational resources. We're going to start with a video that talks about what OER is. It's less than two minutes, and it does a really a better, much better job than I would of succinctly talking through what OER is and what it's not. And if it goes too fast, don't worry. I have a slide. The next slide will summarize the points here, so we'll be able to see it in two ways. All right. OER are open educational resources. These are uh, materials that have had an open license applied to them. So it could be a full textbook, a single unit, a worksheet, an interactive activity, anything that helps with teaching and learning. They can be printed out into physical copies for a very low cost and given to the students. It can also be an online resource as well. So open educational resources include not only openly licensed materials, but also resources that are in the public domain. This includes everything from photos from NASA to reports published by the government and uh, even things like bills and laws. OER are different than uh, traditional published resources because they come with the, the license to make adaptations to the material kind of baked into the resource um, from the beginning. Open educational resources can be considered as free plus permissions. And those permissions are five R's. You can reuse, remix, revise, retain and redistribute the content. Reuse means to take a resource and use it in any context you want. Remix means taking multiple resources and mixing them together and creating a new resource out of it. Revise means to make a copy of the resource and actually change it and adapt it to the local context. Retain means to keep and control a copy of the resource forever. And finally, redistribute means the right to freely share whatever you've created. All right, so in summary, and we're hopeful that this, this slide can help if you need to come back, um, but I'm going to go through this so you know and you have some confidence around what is OER and, and what it's not. Um, specifically, there are two things you want to look for. First and foremost, that it's in the public domain, all right, or that it has a a license that specifically gives permission for it to be at no cost use, um, for it to be adapted and then redistributed. That means to be reshared out. And this is really, really essential to OER. It, basically what it means is that the, the, the things that you find, 
you can tweak, you can customize, and you're going to see we really, really want teachers here today and people that partner with us going forward to know that they have permission and are, are expected to go into our activities and think about the ways that they can make it better. We invite you to do that. We certainly hope, though, that you'll share back so that we can learn from you and improve them and offer those improvements to all. Resources that are not OER, and there are some examples here that hopefully will help you, they have a different type of license. And so you can think of things that, um, for example, might be subscription based from a library collection, right? They're purchased by a library for faculty, staff, and students that are part of that system or institution or they might um, be purchased digital course materials. You can think of something like Vistas, which is something that a lot of us that are Spanish teachers, we've used um, their materials before, typically a school district or a program or students have purchased that licensing. And so that's restricted to the people that have, have actually paid for it. Um, they're not editable, they're not adaptable, I can't reshare them. And then also, and this is the, the line that gets a little gray, I think the hardest one to decipher is oftentimes the free online resources that you can see, but that don't carry an open license. And I want to show you some examples. First, um, I want to show you some, talk to you about what are the, some of the benefits of OER, and then we'll, I'll show you a couple examples. So um, you can think of OER Sorry, I think the, the plane stopped. There we go. So when students, oftentimes we, we think of OER as, as just textbooks, but one thing that I, I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that OER isn't just textbook. In fact, everything that is pathways is, is ancillary, meaning they're activities. It's not a textbook. And what that's done is it's given us the ability to offer pathways to a much larger audience because we're not pigeonholed to one specific language or level or even region. Um, and so actually ancillary materials um, have a, a tremendous benefit for, for teachers. But of course, OER textbooks are so important because they, they, they're cost savings. Um, and there's a lot that's out there. I think most often when people hear about OER, the first thing that they hear about are textbooks and cost savings. It's really important. Um, but also there are other things like representation, diversity, offering more um, resources to students that promote social justice, inviting students to co-create with you or inviting teachers so that they can be part of that creative process. Um, they have more autonomy to, to actually deliver the content in the ways that they want. Um, we know that when students and teachers have more of their own voice in the materials, it leads to better learning gains. And that's why we're all here, right? And so let me show you one of my favorite um, resources that's that's open access, but that's not OER in the sense that um, I can't edit this, this site. This is 68 um, Voices. I don't know if you've seen this. It might be, um, it, it looks like it would just be uh, for Spanish teachers, but actually, and I'm going to click on it here, try to show it to you. Um, this is such a beautiful project. Uh, you can see 68 um, voices refers to the 68 indigenous languages that are spoken in Mexico and it's digital storytelling. It's absolutely beautiful. They've worked with the community to create these gorgeous slides and be able to have somebody read in the indigenous language um, this story. And so, and they're translated into the, in, they're in uh, three languages, the indigenous language, the original language, um, Spanish and English. And so this is an example of something that's beautiful that I can access online, but as I scroll down and I look for the license, I can see here, uh, it has a specific, specific license. It's not OER. I can't take their materials, change them, revise them, and share them, okay? It doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it, I shouldn't be using it. It's, it's phenomenal. It's wonderful. And I, I, I love integrating this in my classes. It just means that it's a different type of resource than OER. So if we come back here, this is a, a material that Shannon, who's here, she can wave, um, has created. And I love it because it's a one pager. <laughs> so many times the, the documents about copyright um, include you know, a presentation that's 50 slides long and that can feel really overwhelming. So what we are gonna encourage you to do, and Shannon is gonna include the link here in, in, the, in the chat, 
all you need to do is go here and you can see a one page document that explains very clearly the different types of licensing so that you know how to recognize if something is openly licensed and you have the ability to edit and adapt it. Okay. And you're going to probably be looking for this type of a, a license, a Creative Commons license. However, it's not the only way that you can make something um, open uh, in OER, rather. So this document does a great job of doing that. Copyright can feel a little bit overwhelming, so it's going to actually be one of the topics for our free webinars this fall. So we encourage you to bookmark that as well, um, because it really could be um, it's its own topic. But nonetheless, this is a really helpful material for you to be able to access. All right, so what are the five cycles of OER? Um, this is really, really important. We mentioned that we're part of this, this NEH grant, and this is really the, the aim. We are aiming to engage in OER-enabled pedagogy. And it means that what we are trying to do is we are trying to, oops, sorry, let's see here. We're trying to help teachers know how to retain, so download and maintain a copy, to reuse what they find that's OER with their students, to revise it, to customize it, to make it their own, and then to remix it, which is sometimes um, can feel maybe a little bit challenging. It's like, how, how am I gonna remix this activity with another activity? And yet what we found is that um, of our pathway subscribers, Half of you are already doing this. It can mean something like using a video or an image and integrating it with an existing OER activity. So that's going to be the focus for a fourth session or a fourth part today after lunch. And then the whole goal is that at the end of, of this cycle or the ways that you engage in this cycle is that you would feel confident and excited to share back your work so that that work could be remixed, revised and redistributed as well um, for other people. We know that in world languages specifically, we are a specific niche and there's not a lot of us compared to other content areas. And so all the more, it's really important that we work together. To that end, one of the core beliefs of this project and the whole aim here is that you here today, all of us engaging in this process, again, not a product, but the process of OER leads to transformative pedagogical experiences. We really hope that that will be the process um, or the experience for you. And um, that's that's the aim for today. There was one person who uh, remarked that um, the more she, I'm going to read this quote because it got at the heart of what I was just explaining this core belief, this transformative uh, pedagogical experience. And you'll see what I mean. So she said, or he said, or they said, the more options I have to choose from when seeking materials to use in my class, the better. And when I can compare the ones I find, I can usually pick the best one versus settling for just one option. Sometimes I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. And in the process, learn to rule out the materials which are not communicative or non, not standards based. And what we see here is a teacher, right, who was given a little bit of time and knew where to look and was able to use her or his or their own experience and expertise to find what was most meaningful, right? And in so doing, was able to apply what they know about best practices, standards-based practices, and, um, and, and everything that we know about communicative or proficiency performance-based teaching. There's a lot of research. I'm not gonna read this. You can take a screenshot if you want, um, but you can absolutely come back here. These are all open source materials. You can read to your heart's content. I love talking research and I'm very, very excited to see a lot of the, the work that is coming out. Um, we're hopeful to contribute to that work. There's not a lot actually that has been done with world language teachers. I know that's shocking to you all, um, but we're hoping to contribute to that um, by being able to, to understand a little bit more how teachers engage with these materials. But this, this is a great way um, to come back and see what the, what the research says. Might be interesting for you to know a little bit about the ways that this community uses OER. We found that actually about you know a third um, uses OER resources at least once a week, if not daily. A quarter uh, uses it monthly, and then a little less than a quarter uses it rarely. But then there's still about twenty percent right here that never use it. 
and that's okay. That's why people, that's why you're here. Um, everybody's got to start somewhere. And I think a lot of times the reason people don't use OER is because it can feel really overwhelming to hit Chrome, open up a browser and try to find something. We know that that can be time consuming. And so again, the whole purpose today is to give you lots of time to be able to do that and find it. As I noted before, ancillary materials are, are what we are about with the Pathways Project. And we found that of the Pathways community, which are K all the pre-K all the way through higher ed instructors, everyone um, more highly regards ancillary materials over textbooks. And so, um, and you can read below the reasons for that, but we really believe that what you're going to see here with the Pathways Project is going to be something that doesn't impose um, a, a certain way of teaching or a certain curriculum, but hopefully empowers you to find what you need and again to customize it. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition into our first uh, breakout room activity. And I'm going to explain things first. <laughs> you all know this trick, right? You're all teachers. You've taught online. So I'm going to explain things first, and then we're going to put you in breakout rooms. It's going to be really important, and it'll be easier for me to show you this um, slide first, and then I'll go back to the other one. We're going to drop a link, okay, um, for you to be able to access a document that basically has this in front of it. And I want you to go ahead and open up that link, please, first. You need to open it up because we can't share it with you once you're in your breakout rooms. So please open the link so that you're not lost. Okay, so um, this link, on this link there are, there's going to be, do you see this here? This is a static screenshot, but there's a link that says OER Repositories Guide. You're gonna be working with that for 10 minutes individually. We're not gonna put you in a breakout room just yet. Okay, we're going to give you 10 minutes to just look that over, to skim it, to click on things, to explore. And once the 10 minutes is up, which you'll know by this timer here on the screen, then we're going to move you into a breakout room with three other people, three to four, depending on our numbers. And, you know, you know, you know how it works here with Zoom. When you do that, we're going to ask you to engage for 10 minutes with your group and to share out which things you found most helpful, what you liked. Um, talk about what you what you found in that exploration. You'll get a um, a broadcast in your breakout room that says report out step three. Okay, at that time we're going to ask that one member in your group clicks on that link and contributes to our Mentimeter. How many of you have used Mentimeter before? It's like a poll system. Every, yeah, poll everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. If you haven't, it's very easy. Basically, what we're going to ask you to do is to compromise in your group. So you get to share out what your favorites are, and then you've got to come up with your top three as a group. Okay, that's your that's your goal. And then the person who reports out, just one per group, will select just the top three. Mentimeter will allow you to select all nine. You don't need to do that. Just your top three. Okay. When we come all back into this room, then we'll see the results that are in. What's the goal here? Remember our, our, our teacher can do is the goal is to be able to define, identify and locate. And this is that first step. We want you to be able to locate some OERs and not, and we'll eventually get to the pathways project. This document focuses on OER um, materials outside of pathways. So we hope that you'll get to start there and, and see what they are. And then we'll move you um, in, in part two, we'll be talking about the pathways project specifically. Again, just wanna remind you that um, this document was created with you in mind, not general disciplines. It was created for world language teachers, okay? And so we really hope that you'll share it with your colleagues. Um, it is meant to be shared. Also, one other thing before we move you or before we start the clock and give you the exploration, that link should have prompted you to make a copy. Um, you can do this with Google Documents by going to the URL and cutting out edit, which is the last little word and putting copy. And what that does is it regenerates a link that automatically shares out a copy of whatever you created. Many of you probably do that and knew it long before I did. I was always sharing a copied, a copied edit, uh, editable version, but if you didn't know, it's a fun hack. All right, so it is your copy now. You can annotate on it. You might use the highlighting feature to help you in your group discussion. Okay, so now what we're gonna do um, is explain how in the next 10 minutes you might want to manage um, if you have a question. So 
what we are going to do is we're going to keep everyone here in this main main salon or uh, sala uh, salon uh, main room, and we are going to put uh, our facilitators in a breakout room. If you have a question. I will move you to one of those breakout rooms with a facilitator, and that'll be kind of like an office, if you will, to ask your question. Does that make sense? All right. And so um, if you don't have a question, that's fine, but help us out, please, by using the word help in the chat. And that way I'll be able to know and immediately get you to a breakout room where you can get that help that you need. Sound good? So you're not moving to a breakout room just yet. You're staying here. I'm gonna start the, everybody got their, their link open and is ready to start looking at this. So you should be able to see this repository. Okay, so it says make a copy, you've done this. My internet's slow, I wonder why. Lots of people on the Zoom, you have it. Yeah, here it is. So you should be able to access this document. And now because it is a copy, please go ahead and mark it up to your heart's content. All right, I'm gonna go here, start the timer and we're good to go. Okay, well, I hope you all had a nice break, had the opportunity to maybe stretch your legs, grab a cup of tea or coffee. And we are going to jump into part two. And this is where I, we're really excited because we're gonna start sharing the Pathways Project materials with you specifically. We've got a little taste of OER, maybe some really cool sites. It was fun to look over the Mentimeter and see uh, lots of fans of Google Arts and Culture. Um, and we're gonna talk about it later, but if you don't have their app, something worth checking out. It's pretty cool. Um, but what we're going to talk about in, in this section is specifically how to find interpersonal speaking activities and how to download them or bookmark them and how to reuse them in your classroom. Um, but before we get started, I'd like for everyone just to take a second to sign in. Um, this is great, especially if we have new participants. Uh, we'll drop the link in chat here for you. Um, but this helps us for research purposes to be able to say, hey, we had, you know, X number of people here. Um, and that is really helpful for, for getting funding to do this type of thing again. So um, please take a second to do that. And again, the link is in chat for you. And uh, we're going to continue the theme of teacher can do. So I have four can do's for this section for you. I want you to be able to explain the importance of interpersonal speaking activities to another instructor and maybe most importantly to your students. And I'd love for you to be able to identify what the Pathways Project has to offer. So we've talked about OER um, and now I want you to know specifically what this project has to offer you and your students. I'd like for you to be able to describe what a, a performance-based activity is. And then also, I think this is the most important one for the section is to be able to find and identify a Pathways Project activity that you can perhaps use and revise for use in your classroom. Okay, so just to make sure that we're on the same page, what is interpersonal communication? If you have your own personal definition, I would love for you to throw it in chat. I'm going to give you my short, um, short and sweet uh, definition. Um, so it's a two way exchange of information, right? So rather than what I'm doing right here, where it's a presentation, it, we should be engaging and talking with one another. Um, and most importantly, it's not just me talking to somebody and somebody talking back. We are constantly listening and, and observing one another and we're making adjustments and we're trying to make sure that the meaning that we want to communicate is being communicated. And if it isn't, we're doing everything we possibly can, right? We're using gestures, nonverbal communication, asking questions. And uh, interpersonal communication is spontaneous and unpredictable, right? There's no script. Uh, we never really know what we're getting into. And again, we're making adjustments and clarifications to make sure that our message is understood. And there's really two types of interpersonal communication. We have speaking and signing and listening activities. And then we have reading and writing, which is text message. And then now, nowadays, this is quite popular, right? Social media, um, whether that be through Instagram, whether that be through Discord, Reddit, um, that is becoming more and more popular uh, as a way of communicating. So today we are going to focus in on interpersonal communication activities, and we're going to specifically focus in on this conversation aspect, okay? How can we provide our students more opportunities to practice in the uh, speaking in the classroom? 
I want to hear from you, though, really quickly, why you think that interpersonal speaking is worth focusing on. Why is this something that we're dedicating a whole workshop to? Why is it something that that we need to practice with our students? So please take a second. Uh, there's a link, a direct link in chat and let us know. And I am going to project the results with you. I like learning through doing. That was Kelly's theme at the beginning, right? Most useful aspect of communication is what students will encounter most when they go out into the real world. Yeah, this is something that I really think about. Why did our students sign up for, for a world language class, right? Did they sign up because they wanted to learn how to conjugate verbs? No, they wanted to go out and explore the world and make friends and, and uh, interact with new people, right? Um, and so that is part, part of why um, this is so important. And I think it's something that is really um, a hook for students to get them interested. Authentic experiences, providing real world experience. Awesome. Um, go, I invite you to scroll through here if you have a chance. And I have a few reasons too that I want to make sure that I cover with you. So a lot of these were, were mentioned. Um, but yeah, building relationships, being able to share thoughts and feelings, forming connections, um, career readiness, right? It, this is also a skill, being able to have a conversation and, and interact with somebody else um, and really being able to adjust your, your, your language based on who you're speaking with too, right? Uh, and then also um, developing intercultural competency that inter our interpersonal speaking is really the gateway to that um, and and so much more. So a little bit about the Pathways Project community and who we are before we take a look at the activities. I thought it might be helpful for you to see how we are set up. And so this is our, our bridge, so to speak, and our pre-service teachers are vital to the the to the work that we are doing. So our team is made up of uh, higher education students, faculty, and staff, and then also K through 12 pre-service and in-service teachers. So we're quite a unique project. Um, we don't see a lot of projects that are working with both higher education and K through 12. And uh, we have a uh, team of students that help to create the activities. Uh, we have pre-service teachers that help to really make sure that they are pedagogically sound and our in-service teachers and our lead teachers really help to work on the classroom management piece of the activities to help sure that culture is infused and to polish those activities. So that is a little bit about our model of practice. Uh, and we have lots of information on our website if you're interested in learning more about how we're set up. What's available? So many of you have had the opportunity to explore the, the Pathways Project, but if you haven't, I want to just quickly let you know what we have available to you. We have over 800 interpersonal speaking activities that are ready for the community to revise and remix. We have professional development like you're in today. We have a whole archive of different webinars and workshops that we've had in the past, and we have many more opportunities to come. We'll make sure that we discuss those opportunities too at the end of the, the workshop today. We have some really cool OER student projects. We have anything from study abroad guides to Bilbao, Spain, and uh, Tokyo, Japan, to free design resources. And then one of the most important aspects is we have a friendly, encouraging community of teachers all across Idaho and the globe that are here to support one another. Um, Idaho being a rural state, especially, I feel like this community is so important. We, we know that many of our teachers, they might be the only teacher in their district. They're only, only world language teacher in the district, right? And we want to give you the opportunity to connect with others across the state. And I'm sure that there's many of you in other states who are feeling the same way. So we hope that we can be a community that we can um, uh, touch base and, and really uh, foster relationships with them. 
here are uh, some of our Pathway Project subscribers. I couldn't show the whole world without making the, the US super tiny, um, but we have a link um, we can put in chat. If your city is not featured on the map, we would love to include you. Drop that in chat, and then after today's workshop, I will go in and add you. Um, but as you can see, we have lots of users in Idaho, um, but we have users all across the United States, Canada, um, and I think we have uh, India, Germany, France, Spain, China, and there might be a few other countries that, that I am missing. Um, but if you're not on there, please let us know. We'd love to get you added. All right, we're going to play a quick game, um, uh, this or that. So Kelly and I have talked a little bit about who we are and what the Pathway Project is, but we want to make sure that we're on the same page about kind of some of our goals and what we have to offer. So this is just a quick little game. Let's go ahead and play. And it's the same code as before. All right, we need to get our players in, so go ahead and join. In. Amber, your Mentimeter is way better than mine. Look how cute. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. You know, this is cool because it reminds me a lot of Kahoot, but it's nice because you can do just one question at a time, but it keeps track of the score. It's pretty neat. So if you haven't used this feature of Menti, it's pretty fun. With the free version, you can have uh, five quiz questions. Okay, I'm going to give everyone 20 seconds more and then I'll start the countdown. I love the little icons though. Quite fun. All right. So which of the following best describes the Pathway Project, this or that? Awesome, you all got it right. So yes, we are not a textbook company. We are not a for-profit organization. We are a group of really passionate language teachers, students and staff um, who are offering up free materials. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, okay, there we go. So what types of materials are available from Pathways? Time's up. Awesome, you all got it right. Yep, so we don't have textbooks or grammar instruction. We have a lot of awesome interpersonal speaking activities, different activities and professional development. It's our leaderboard. <laughs> okay, we got two more quick questions. Okay, Pathways Project materials are Awesome. So they are openly licensed and customizable. That's something we're going to talk about in the third section of today's workshop when we go to revise. You'll find that you can change every aspect from the instructions to the materials, the slide deck. It's all customizable. All right. And last question. The Pathways Project's materials are... Awesome. They are available for teachers worldwide to use. So everyone here, even though we're based out of Boise State, everyone here is welcome to use these materials. Please share them with your colleagues. They are for all world language teachers. 
Okay, so the activities that we're going to be showing you today are performance based activities. How many of you out of curiosity, you can give me a thumbs up are familiar with the idea of performance based activities anyone familiar with this concept. Cool. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page here are just a couple of things to keep in mind. So these activities take place in the classroom, so it makes it a controlled environment, right? We try to replicate an authentic experience as much as possible, but still in the classroom, right? We still have kind of control of the variables. Um, we are targeting a specific performance range, and that's part of the thing about being in the classroom, right? We can say we're going to target a novice level, a novice mid, or we're going to target an intermediate high. And we're going to push students towards the next level, right? You might have heard of that I plus one idea, right? We're going to push them to use strategies to get to that next level, but we're being really purposeful with our activities. Um, they are all about practicing, practicing, practicing. So this is something I think is really important to take away from our pathways activities. They are not, um, they're not to, to introduce new material, rather they're really there to help um, reinforce the vocabulary, the language functions, that the cultural elements that you have been practicing with your students, okay? So you might, you know, you might do some just in time learning in those activities, but they're really there to help reinforce. And our expectations are going to be higher when we are in the classroom than if we were in a non-instructional setting, right? Because again, we have a little bit of control. Um, so they're going to do a little bit better than maybe if we were to throw them into a like an authentic language experience, right? Um, and what we're doing is we're really looking at four domains um, to see if students are performing. And I want to share those four domains with you. So there's four things. There's language control, vocabulary, communication strategies, and cultural awareness. We could do a whole workshop on this, right? So I'm not going to go over this too much. You can come back to these slides. For those of you who are just joining, a question that we get a lot is, are these slides going to be available? Yes, everything from today is going to be available openly for you. Um, but I think these are really helpful when you are looking at an activity. Um, is, is the vocabulary something that you've covered in, and or is it something that you need to adjust? Um, what about the cultural awareness? Um, are, what kind of accuracy are you expecting from your students, right? So these are just four things um, that really help us know if our students are at level or if maybe they still have a ways to go. Okay. And I want to show you real quickly how our activities are formatted. Um, this is something that's really cool. Across all levels and all languages in the Pathways Project, we follow a consistent template and a consistent format. So all of our activities begin with the actual can-do statements. How many of you are familiar with the actual can-dos? Thumbs up if you are. Yay, awesome. Woohoo. They are so cool because they are student friendly learning objectives, right? Sometimes we write learning objectives and they're kind of teacher, teacher language. I love the can do's because they really are for our students. Um, we have a warm up to help students get prepared for the main activity to transition into the target language and hopefully boost their confidence a little bit. We have a main activity and I always like to think of this as a linguistic workout. It's going to, it's going to make them sweat maybe a little bit, right? But that's good. We want to challenge them. Um, in that, again, that controlled sort of environment that we were talking about. And then we're going to boost their confidence and leave on a happy note with us to cool down. Hopefully they like forget how hard that was and they're happy and they're ready to go on with their day. And we finish with the can do statements, uh, asking the students to do sort of like a self reflection to think about, hey, where am I at? Um, this is something that I still need to work on or do I feel pretty confident with these these learning objectives? So we have two different ways to find an activity with the Pathways Project. We have the OER Commons collection and we have Pressbooks. Um, how many of you just out of curiosity, again, I love to just visually see, all, see you all. Give me a thumbs up if you have been on our OER Commons group. How many of you have been? Awesome. How many of you have had the opportunity to go to Pressbooks? Anybody? So for today's workshop, we're going to focus in on OER Commons because we really want to be inclusive and these are available for all of these languages listed here. And then we have a really great collection of templates in English. So if you don't see your language listed here, no worries. We have these English templates that you can adapt for your language. The Pressbooks collection, if you are a French, German or Spanish teacher, you have to check these out. They're really polished and this is our goal 
with all of the activities is to, by the end of the year, we'll have Arabic, American Sign Language, Japanese and Korean press books available too. So if you're not on our newsletter, make sure you do that. We'll give you information on how to get on there. Um, but OER Commons is really great because it's like a database or a repository and it's really easy to search and you can find activities for like the thematic topic or the grammar structure that you're looking for. So what I want to do is I want to give you a quick demo on how to find an activity on OER Commons, and then I have a handout for you as well. Um, and I will go ahead and give you the handout now if, if you want to put that in chat. Um, and the handout will walk you through step by step what I'm going to visually show you right now. Okay. So to find an activity, you're going to go to boisestate.edu slash pathways project. And we've tried to make it really easy for you. There's two buttons that lead to the same place. You can find an activity for your classroom or click on find activities for your language and level, and they're going to take you to the same place. Okay. And once I scroll down, we have put this into steps for you. So step one is to select your language below. And again, if you don't see your language, we have English level or English language activities that are adaptable for any language. I'm going to go through and show you Spanish, um, but definitely click on your language. All right. And then we have select your level. Okay. So these activities are, um, they're centered around the actual proficiency levels, um, uh, but we have uh, the levels here for you too. This it's on the, the handout, but and it depends on each language, right? But typically this is going to be novice low to novice mid, novice mid to novice high, novice high to intermediate low, and intermediate low to maybe intermediate mid, if that's helpful for you. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click on level one. And what it's going to do is it's going to take me directly to this OER Commons collection. And so I can see here all resources in Spanish and all resources in level one. Over on the left hand side, I can also, if I want to, I can see that the Spanish folder is open and I can see the different levels here. So if I want to jump to a different level, I can do that within this page as well. I don't have to go back to the Boise State page. I can do that in here. OK, and then what I can do is I can search here for a thematic topic, for a grammar structure, for um, a cultural piece that I maybe want to talk about. Um, and you can search both in English and in the target language, OK? So let's say that I want to talk about, um, I'm going to do uh, days of the week, for example. So I'll just type in semana. And then here I can see all of the activities that have the keyword or somewhere mentioned in the activity semana, which is week in Spanish. And you'll see here that I have a face-to-face -face activity and I also have an online activity. I'm gonna click on the face-to-face -face activity and all of our activities have a short two to three sentence description. So you can kind of just get a little glimpse before you go into it. And if you're interested, you can click on view resource and then that will walk me through the activity. So what we're going to give you the opportunity to do in this next section is to have about, I'm going to give you about 10, 15 minutes to explore. I want to make sure that we're not too far behind. I think we're right about on, on track. So I'll give you about maybe 12 minutes to explore. Um, and then you're going to have five minutes to give an elevator pitch to a partner. And when I say partner, we're going to put you in groups of three to four again. Um, but we want, you know, you can't go through all the activities and pathways. And especially if you're a German teacher, maybe you want to know what's out there in Spanish or in Japanese, for example, right? So it'll be fun. You'll get to hear from different language teachers. And you're going to just give them like a little pitch of what, the, what you do in the activity. Um, again, there's a handout in the chat that will walk you through step-by-step step, what I just covered with those notes about like the level and things like that. Um, and we will do the breakout rooms again. So if you have questions, if you need help, um, please again, put uh, start your message with help uh, so we can easily identify the questions and we'll get you some help. Um, but with that, I'm gonna give you time to explore. I'll call you back in at about the 15 minute mark, okay? Um, and we will, um, we will go through, let's make sure here. Yep, 
um, I'll call you back in at the 15 minute mark and then we'll, we'll put you in breakout rooms to explore. Okay, sound good? If you have questions, please put them in chat um, and I'm gonna put our office helpers into chat, the breakout rooms as well. Back, everyone. I think we have all breakout groups closed now. So I hope you had the chance to hear from at least one other person, maybe here a different activity than the one that you selected. Um, what we're going to do now, though, is do a even bigger sharing exercise that we hope you'll get to revisit maybe after today's workshop. We're going to actually take the activity that you found and put it on a Padlet board. How many of you have used Padlet out of curiosity? Thumbs up if you've used Padlet before. Yeah, it's such an awesome way. It's kind of like a digital bulletin board. And what I've done is I've set up a column for all the languages that we have signed up. Um, if your language is not on there for some reason, I, I really tried to get everybody, but if it's not at the very end, there's a column. And then I promise I will make you a column after today's workshop. Um, but I'm going to demonstrate for you how to do this activity. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to, oops, I don't know why it says file share. We don't have to do that. You can, you can miss this. You can skip this part. Um, we are going to um, go to the Padlet and I'm going to show you what you're going to do. So as you can see here, we have all the different languages. And if you scroll to the left and to the right, you'll be able to see the different languages that we have on the screen. I put the instructions at the top of the document here for you too. Uh, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna find your language. So let's say that I am Spanish. I'll find that and then I'm gonna click the plus sign here. When I click the plus sign, you'll see this box pop up. And for the subject, it would be really helpful if you put these three things, your name, the language that you instruct, and then the level that you instruct as well, or levels that you instruct. So I'll put Amber, Spanish, and then I'll put levels one and two, for example. Okay. And then in this box, you are going to, oops, excuse me, right below these icons, you're going to see their cursor flashing. And this is where you're going to paste the link to your activity. So if I wanted to share this one, for example, the days of the week activity, I would come back and just copy the link. And then I'm going to paste it here. And if you want, you can write, you know, what thematic unit you think this might fit well in. So I think that this would be great in the, um, the thematic unit where we talk about class schedules and days of the week. And it's sort of like the school life uh, chapter thematic unit, right? So I would put that in here and then I would hit the publish button and then it will show up on the screen. So I'm gonna just put here school life. Okay. And hit publish and then you'll see it up on the screen. And then what's really cool is if you have time, uh, well, if you finish quick, you can click on some of these if you want to. We can give each other likes and we can even add comments. If you have ideas about an activity, if you like something, so it's just a great board for us to come back to even after the workshop. And we can uh, come back and see lots of different activities that caught other people's attention. Okay, So we'll put the link in chat for you. Um, and again, you're going to post your language, your name, and the levels you instruct, the activity that you'd like to customize, and then what thematic unit you think this might fit in. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions that I can answer? Amber, we made a mistake. Our, our all of our colleagues are telling us we're Bask isn't on here. So I was oh maybe, no, maybe you, I can show how easy, maybe you can show how easy it is to add it. There's so yes, many other things. So I how, how can I move to the language? I cannot, I cannot get into Spanish, so. Um, if, you, if, if you're having trouble scrolling, if you use the arrow keys on your keyboard, I also find the left and the right arrow keys will work. But if not, we can get you with somebody um, here in a second to help you. Um, but let me see. Okay, let's, we're gonna add a section. So we're gonna just go to Basque. And then what's cool is I can just drag this. Amber, we should just play that one off like we wanted to model how easy it is. Right. To it live. <laughs> silly <mistake>. yeah. <laughs> um, if there are any other languages I missed since I'm in here, I'd be happy to add them. You can just put that in chat. But I'm going to give everyone uh, about, let's do about five minutes. Does that sound good to everyone? Five minutes. 
to add your um, your uh, site. So I'll go ahead and put the timer. I'll just reuse the timer on this slide here for us. Okay. And again, if you need help, let us know. Um, we can put you in a breakout room with somebody to get you some help. Amber, I wonder, I, we have about a minute left before we take a break, but can you show the Padlet? Because I'm seeing a lot of things pop up, which is really, really fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I also see that Emily is um, saying that Padlet is no longer allowed to be used in West Ada. And so that's a really great, ah, thank you, Cindy. Wakelet is another option. Yeah, we've got lots of great, great sites being added. This is awesome. So cool. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get us into break mode. Um, but if you are still working, by all means, please free to finish up. Um, but we are gonna go ahead and take a break again. Please feel free to go get some coffee, a snack, stretch, do whatever you want, um, maybe a little bit of self-care, whatever that means to you. And then we will be back at 1117. Yeah, if you refresh the screen, it'll update for you, Amber. Sorry about that. That's okay. And then, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and see you all back here in about 10 minutes. Next part is revising and customizing. Okay, so I hope that our last activity was a helpful exercise. Maybe you got to meet one or two language instructors who you haven't talked to before. And I really encourage you to bookmark that Padlet um, and we can come back to it and see different activities that other languages and other levels selected. Now what we're going to do in this section is talk about how to take that activity that you found and maybe it's not a perfect fit, right? Maybe there's some things that you want to change to meet the needs of your students and you're going to learn how to revise the activity. Uh, let's go ahead and sign in one more time before lunch. And again, if you're just joining us, this really helps us for research purposes to see who's here, helps us get funding to provide things like this for free. Our can do's for this section, we're going to list a few reasons why you might want to revise an activity, locate where you're going to go to actually revise the activity, and then you're going to have about 15, 20 minutes of working time to apply the principles of revising to an activity. Okay? You might not finish today, but we hope that you'll be able to get started and um, then you'll learn a little bit more about remixing after lunch. So look at this recipe. Take a second just to scan it. I mean, we're going to do this pretty quickly, but scan through this. How might you change this activity or recipe, excuse me, or adapt this recipe based on your own personal preferences and likes? Okay. So I want you to think about that. And then uh, again, I'm going to give you just 15, 20 seconds to just quickly scan it. Everyone have something that they might change about the recipe? All right, and then I'm going to have you go to Menti, and I'm going to have you type in 79197812, and we'll put the link in chat. All right, and I've got the results projected if you'd like to see. See, swap the pecans for walnuts. Yes, I like pecans more than walnuts. I agree. Ah, some flowers for allergy friendly. Take out the vanilla. Change the quantity or change the dairy for vegan. Ah, yeah, I'm a dark chocolate lover over, over milk chocolate. Yeah, and please don't feel that you need to take this too seriously. It's just any way that you might change the, the recipe. Awesome. So just for fun, here's how I might change or adapt this recipe. So I personally like non-dairy butter, and maybe I don't have that specific type of vanilla extract, but I have some that my parents brought back from Mexico. So I might use that Mexican vanilla extract. I love peanut butter chocolate chips as well. So I might do half dark chocolate and half peanut butter. And then when it comes to the 
uh, in instructions themselves, I might come in here and change um, how it's prepared. I think it calls for an air fryer and maybe I don't have an air fryer. Maybe I want to use an oven. Does that make sense to everybody? So a lot of us, we love to go online and we find recipes, right? But we always make little changes just to adapt it to the needs of our kitchen, to our lifestyle, and to our own personal preferences when it comes to recipes like cookies, for example. Um, and I had, I think I had a little typo in this last slide, uh, but Kelly corrected it, not knowing what, <laughs> not knowing what I was doing. Um, I wanted to show you that, so I had baking spelled incorrectly. And the reason why I have, I just want to show you why I have this blue here is that this, that is a revision, but it's not something that like I would recommend revising an activity for. If you catch a typo, if you want to just change like, um, you know, a grammatical mistake or things like that. Um, if, if I saw this on Joy the Baker's recipe, I would probably just email her or I might comment on her recipe and say, hey, Joy, I, I noticed that you have a mistake. Same thing with the Pathways Project. You don't have to go through the process of revising an activity if you catch any typos or grammatical errors. We're really responsive. Our email address is pathwaysproject at boisestate.edu. Send us an email and in a couple of business days, we'll update that. So there are definitely things that need to be revised. Um, and we're, there's, you know, we're human um, and the, a lot of these activities are made by students, right? And we proofread, um, but we still, um, we still have mistakes. So you can email us and we will help you with that. Um, so let's apply that same idea, right, of, hey, I have, uh, I have uh, some instructions and now I want to tailor them to fit the needs of my students, not my kitchen, my students in this case, right? So I'd like to give you just a minute to just read over this activity. It's a short warm up. I can't, can't give you a whole activity that would take too long, but just a little piece of an activity in English. And I want you to think about one thing. Just one thing that you would do to adapt this to meet the needs of your language classroom. Does that make sense to everybody? So just think of one thing. And then I will have you go back to Menti and add what changes would you make to this warm up. But I'll go ahead and leave this slide up for you so you can look at the warm up for a minute and then we'll come back to the Menti. So I'm gonna give you about a minute or so to look over this and just pick one thing. If you have time to pipe in more, awesome, but just share one thing that you would change. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. Ah, one of the most obvious ones, use the target language. That's great, right? So change the instructions from English into the target language. Yep, that's awesome. Change the image for younger kids. Add sentence frames to scaffold for my K through five kids. Share why would your friend like this activity? Ah, provide lists of stores in the target language for students to choose from. Maybe from, from places in the, the target culture too, right? That would be really cool. Um, you're planning a party for your besties. What activities would they like to do? Love this. What occasion would you buy for? See, this is what we're talking about, y'all. I want to take a screenshot of this and immediately make some revisions to this activity. Mm -hmm. Very cool ideas. A little bit more scaffolding at a cultural aspect. Ah, oh, the party's happening in Senegal. That's really cool explain who you'd buy it for and why. Yeah, that's awesome. So this is just a snippet of one of the activities. Remember, we have the warm up, the main activity and the wrap up, but you did a great job going through and thinking about how you might revise this. So I want you to see, I think sometimes when we talk about the concept of revision, that feels a little scary. It's like, wow, I've got to make so many changes, but you were able to very, just in a minute or so, very quickly think of some changes that you can make to make this activity better for your students. So a couple other reasons why you might want to revise that we maybe didn't cover in the mentee. Um, better fit your preferences or your teaching style. If you have an online classroom, if you have a group of 30 students versus a group of eight students, for example, or maybe um, there's a certain way that you like to teach that you want to, to incorporate. 
um, localize the materials to fit your learning environment, right? So some of our activities in the Pathways Project reference Boise State. And if you are somewhere else, you might want to customize that to include the name of your school or maybe local like shops in the local area that you're at, um, or even to incorporate um, you know, like multicultural um, elements to it, which I have think in the last bullet here, but maybe you want to include a variety of different things, of different shops from different places. Maybe there's only stores in France and you want to include some other um, French speaking countries, for example. Um, alter the length or the difficulty. I saw a lot of you mentioning scaffolding. That is wonderful. Adjust the content to fit a different age group. Yeah, I saw a couple of comments to change the pictures for younger kids adjust for a different language, right? So this is in English, so all of you would have had to adapt this, but we encourage you to even look at the, uh, look at activities from different languages and to adapt those. Um, and then, like I said, address uh, multiculturalism um, by improving the representation, um, addressing diversity needs, and really, as Kelly mentioned at the very beginning of our workshop, making our students feel represented in the materials. So I have a really great graphic I'm going to share with you. Um, I don't know if anyone has anyone seen this graphic before. It's from user interface design. Uh, I think this is a really great reminder of some of the things that as we remix or revise or even just create new activities from scratch that we might want to keep in mind. Um, so often Shannon and I and I were I was our OER librarian. Wave Shannon. So um, we were talking about uh, that. I feel like gender and um, also ethnicity are ones that maybe we do a good job of, um, but maybe we, we think we miss out on some of these other things. So if you have a unit on food, what about diets? Are you representing different diets, both from our students, but also from the, the target culture, right? Um, I think about housing a lot. So it's so common in our textbooks to see, I'm gonna pick on French, for example, but you to see a beautiful Parisian apartment in the textbook. And is that representative of French speakers around Around the world. No, everybody lives in so many different accommodations, including our students, right? So think about different incomes and social classes when you um, create activities and also when you um, use visual materials. Um, ableness, for example, is a really great one too. It's something that we often forget about. Um, and I have this really cool presentation that we'll put the link in chat for you. It is a list of free design resources. So hopefully that will that will get you excited. And then you'll be even more excited when you learn that they're inclusive design resources. Um, and so we have a really great collections of different types of photos, illustrations, graphics that are openly licensed. There's information on how to give credit. That's another question that I know that I struggle with a lot even. Um, so there's information there. And so this is as you start to um, revise or remix an activity that could be really helpful for you to um, be thinking about some of the visuals that you might want to include or replace in the activity. So I just wanted to plant the seed for that. Um, we are going to do another workshop um, where we really dive into this a little bit more, uh, or webinar, excuse me, and we'll have the, uh, the list of the topics for you soon. Um, but I think it's something that uh, we can all do, um, just be cognizant of and, and really try to embrace when we are revising and also creating new materials. Okay, so now we're going to get ready to customize our activity. And so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit more about why we might want to customize. And then I'm going to give you a demo of how to do so. Um, so the majority of teachers customize their OER materials at, um, at least half or more of the time. And we found, at least with our teachers, right, that one of the most common reasons is to make it more appropriate for the, the group, the age group that they're working with, right? So we are at the university level. And so there's some things that you might need to adjust if you're working with middle school or um, preschool students or elementary students. Um, but uh, most of all, we really want to make it so that you feel like you can fit the materials to the way that you like to teach. This should feel really empowering. Textbooks so often are difficult to edit, and um, we we can't um, we can't add things very easily, right? Especially when it comes to the the written instructions. Um, and so I I pulled this out from one of the surveys that uh, we, we we sent out recently, and the participant here says that, hey, like sometimes my students, they can't remember the term mother-in-law, 
So the next chapter is about shopping. A textbook, I can't really make that change, but with OER, I could try to incorporate the term for mother-in-law over and over to really help reinforce that, that tricky vocabulary word and give students extra practice. So they say, for example, that in the shopping activity, maybe they are gonna go shopping for a mother-in-law. And so what articles of clothing would students feel comfortable buying for their mother-in-law? And which ones would they avoid? I could keep on with the clothing, but bringing up hard vocabulary terms again and again. And so again, it's really adaptable and customizable based on your, your group of students, what they're struggling with, what they're doing well with, and the way that you like to teach. Does that make sense to everybody? Why we want to we want to customize and revise? Great. So now I'm going to take a little bit of time to show you how to revise in OER Commons. I am just going to show you how to do it. You are not going to have to do this today, but I want you to know that when the time comes, it's very, very easy to do so. Instead, today we're going to give you a worksheet and we're going to give you about 20 minutes to look through the activity and plan for how you might revise the activity. So again, I'm going to show you how to do this. You're not going to do this today, but I really want you to just feel confident in knowing that when it, the time comes, it's quite easy to do so. Okay, so in OER Commons, there is a remix button. It looks like this. It's a green button and it's on every single activity. Um, and in OER Commons, it's important to understand that remix equals both revising and remixing. We're going to talk about what remixing is in the next session um, after lunch. Um, but remixing is kind of this idea of like, let's talk about the chocolate chip cookie recipe, for example. Maybe I really like Joy the Baker's chocolate chip cookie recipe, and then I really like Sally's Baking Addiction chocolate chip cookie recipe. And I'm going to take those two recipes and merge them and make them into the best chocolate chip cookie recipe ever. Does that make sense? So that's like remixing. We're gonna, you're taking multiple sources and combining them to make a new activity. Revising is just like what we did at the very beginning, where we're making some changes to the activity to fit the fit the needs of our students. But this button allows you to do both things. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through a short demonstration, and then I'll show you the worksheet. And like I said, you'll have about 20 minutes to work on it. Lunch is coming, so you you can do it. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to have a break here soon. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the activity that I showed you earlier on. It's a Spanish level one activity for days of the week and school subjects. And you'll see here there is this green remix button. Kim, you do need to have a free OER Commons account in order to remix an activity. Um, and you can do you'll be prompted to do that once you click on the button. Um, you do not have to be part of the Pathways Project group or anything like that. We don't have to like, you don't have to become a member or join anything. You do just need to have an OER Commons account. And then you're gonna click on this Remix button. And what's really wonderful is it puts it into an editable document where I can go in here and I can start to make changes. Okay, so I have all of the instructions here and everything is changeable. Okay, so I could completely scratch a section if I wanted to. I can revise and adjust to meet the needs of my students. Um, one thing I wanted to show you is that in many of our activities, we have links to the templates. So you can actually go into the Canva materials, which um, an example of the Canva materials would be like physical cards, question cards, or headbands. Has anyone played headbands with their students before? Yeah, like physical cards that you would print out and use in class. So we actually have links to these here and I can come in here and click on use template and actually make changes to that to fit the needs of my students. Um, most activities have it. Some of our uh, less commonly taught languages may not have them in there yet. So again that pathways project email is going to be your friend bookmark it. We are very responsive. If you want the template email us and within two business days, we can send you the template, okay? So we're working on getting them added for all languages, um, but they might not all be in there yet. So you can just email us and we would be happy to help you. Um, and the Google Slideshows, if you click on the Google Slideshow, 
We have instructions here on the second slide that will walk you through what to do. But basically, you just go to File and then go to Make a Copy. And you can choose to just pull out selected slides. Maybe you only want like the warm up, um, or if you want the entire presentation, you can click on Entire Presentation. So I wanted to show you how easy it is to revise. Once you are finished, you can come here to submit. And then when you hit publish, what's really wonderful is we get a notification too on the Pathways project end that one of our activities has been um, remixed. And again, remix equals revised and remixed with OER Commons. And Kelly's going to talk a little bit more about that in the last part. Um, but if you need help with the, the publishing uh, process, we're also here to help. We are um, really excited to, to empower you to share your awesome ideas. Yeah, Amber, Amber, one question that often comes up with teachers is that if they're in that Canvas link and they want to make mm -hmm. changes to those materials, a fear that is often voiced is, are they going to change the master copy? So I know you said that, but I just wanted to bring that up one more time so that people could hear it loud and clear. Yes. So what's wonderful is that if, as long as you're seeing the screen here where it says a template, you can make as many versions of this as you'd like, and you will never alter our original material. Same thing with the Google Slideshow. We have it set up so that you have to go to file and make a copy. Um, we've been very careful about that um, because we've accidentally edited our own work before. So we really made sure to... Um, to, uh, to, to turn that on. Cindy had a great question too. She said, where does the changed version in OER show up? So what it will do is it will show up under your, I can show you here, let me get out of this. And while you're at it, Muriel had a, um, a really good question too, which is what about the original version? Does it stay? And it does. You could have like, you could have 50 different versions of the same um, activity mm -hmm. if you wanted. There's no, no harm done. There's no problem. It's um, there. Don't ever feel fearful about uh, revising something. You're not going to impact the original copy. Yep. Um, and so if I click on my, my user icon up in the top right hand corner, you can see here where it says my items. And so that's where it's going to be saved. So everything that I have created in OER Commons, all 1006 things, oh my goodness, um, is, is in OER Commons. And then what's nice is that we get a notification um, on our end, and then we can actually add it to the Pathways project group. So don't worry if you submit something, it will not show up in these folders automatically. Um, that is just to make sure that we ha have a little bit of quality control, so to speak, and make sure that things that are actually language materials are in there, not just random spam from the internet, right? <laughs> um, but, and we may contact you too. So Kelly is going to talk about that in step four. Um, but, um, you know, if you have questions about like, hey, I really want to put this cool, authentic video or things like that, we can help you with that. Um, all right, I need some help with like making it look pretty. We can do that too. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that here in, in a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to actually go through a, and I my, lost my speaker notes. Um, here's the planning document. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. That's what I wanted to show everybody. So we have a planning document that you're going to have about 20 minutes. We're right on time, which is great. You're going to have about 20 minutes to work on. Um, and it's the same thing as before. It's going to make a copy. So you don't have to worry. You're not editing my version. Um, I'll click on make a copy. And let's see here. My internet's being a little slow too. Um, but once I make a copy, it's going to take me to a uh, editable worksheet and we have instructions here for you. So you are going to go through, oh, see Kelly, I think I put the, I think that's the wrong link. This is the step six link. Okay, hang on one second. We're gonna get you the right link. Yeah, Jennifer, we, we shared the wrong link with you. So give us one second, we'll get you the right one. All right, hold on. I think it's this one here. Amber, you're faster than me. Sorry about that. I just need to make sure I put um, copy. Copy instead of. Yeah, everyone, we, sorry, that was my fault. Um, Amber's gonna works. send out one that we'll be able to copy now, yeah. 
there we go. So this is the correct document and it should do the same thing. It'll prompt you to make a copy. It's so fun working with teachers. You get it when this kind of thing happens. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, so this is the correct document and let me make it just a little bit larger for everybody. Okay, so what you're gonna do is you are going to first things first, share this document with us. So you'll see here, it says, please share your document. So the easiest way to do that is just to come up to the share button in the top right-hand corner. And then where it says add people in groups, you're gonna add our Pathways Project email address here. So it's just pathwaysproject at boisestate.edu, right there for you. You're gonna add that so that way that we have access to the document, okay? And that will come in handy, especially in part four, which we'll talk about. Then what I'd like for you to do is start by just putting your name, your language and your level, and then same thing as before, copy and paste that link from OER Commons um, so that we know which activity you are planning to revise. Okay, and then um, I have some of those guiding principles that we talked about in the presentation, why you might want to revise an activity, just to jog your memory a little bit. This is how the activities are set up. So if you're looking for like, oh, where are the can-do statements at? You can see, oh, they're about kind of in the middle of the activity. Where's the wrap-up at? Oh, it's towards the end of the activity. I made you sort of a little a visual map of where the different parts of the activity are located. And then what you're going to do is you're going to follow the steps. Please do make sure you do this in order. It's the, the sequence is intentional. So you will start by thinking about something. And then you will then decide what are you gonna maintain or revise? So I'll share this first one with you and then I'll let you get started. Um, but the first one is, are the can do statements too easy, too challenging, just right? And is there an intercultural can do included? Okay, so if you are not familiar with the intercultural can do's, this is hyperlinked, you can take a look at those, but that's a really great thing that you might wanna include. And then also, yeah, just making sure that the difficulty is right for your particular set of students. So then you'll use this table here and you can make some notes about what you might keep and what you might revise. If it, if it fits perfectly for your students, then you can just simply write maintain that you're not gonna make any changes, okay? So you'll have about 20 minutes to work through this and get as much done as you can. No worries if you don't finish. And then please make sure when you get to the stop that you stop here because we're gonna continue on with this in part four, okay? So I'll go ahead and set the timer for 20 minutes. Amber, and let great, you get started. A great question came up really quickly about mm -hmm. whether or not the sharing access should be at the uh, should give us the ability to edit. Um, and I, if you feel comfortable giving us um, edit access, that would be fantastic. It just makes the process easier. If you feel uncomfortable with that, if you could give us commenting access, that would be mm -hmm. fantastic. And at least that way, it facilitates a conversation. We won't change any of your great ideas without asking for permission, I promise. It's just an easier way for us to work with you. Yep, and as questions come up, we'll be monitoring the chat box. But uh, if you are working, you are welcome to turn your camera off and we'll come back together in about 20 minutes just to check in um, right before we go to lunch. So this is our final session for today, but it's a little bit longer and it's a little bit longer, not because I'm going to be talking at you longer, um, because we wanted to work in 45 minutes of work time at the end. So we really hope that this will be a time for you to have all of the links, all of the strategies, all of the information and you can sit down and you can put it into application. So this is the the, the last session where we are gonna um, talk to you about um, the digital humanities and authentic materials. So without further ado, um, please do sign in. I saw Kelly wanted to know if she could sign in. We hadn't gotten there yet, not to worry. Um, a link will be dropped in the chat for you where you can either click on that or if you prefer, um, use your camera to take a snapshot of the, of the QR code and then you'll be able to, um, to get right in there. All right, thank you again for those of you who might be new or hadn't heard it before. We're just asking people to sign in 
so that we can um, honor those who are getting PD credit and keep tabs of who's showing up, but also to so that we understand who's here for research purposes. And um, we promise we won't be spamming you. All right, the link is- Kelly, <clears throat> yeah, okay. it's not loading for me either. I just checked it. No problem. Um, what we'll do is Amber can, I, I know Amber will get right on it. Yes, I'll fix it. Go ahead and can carry on it. Kelly and then I'll fix it. Uh, it's the QR code that doesn't work. Okay. Um, we'll fix it and we'll get right on it. Thanks for your patience. All right. So without uh, further ado, what are the teacher can do for part four? So the goal is that you're going to be able to explain to a colleague what the digital humanities are or is and how they specifically can support language teaching and world cultures in general. And then we're gonna give you time to brainstorm and identify ways in which both the digital humanities and authentic resources or materials um, will help you specifically augment or enhance or improve or add on whatever type of verb you wanna use there, um, the unit that you've selected. So the Padlet, if you remember the Padlet that had all of the columns where you found your language and you posted an activity that you're thinking about remixing or revising, what we're gonna do in this fourth session is we're going to aim to try to help you find additional materials that can fit within that unit, the unit that you're thinking of um, as, you, as you continue. Good, I'm seeing in the chat that the link works. So I'll give you guys a, a minute here to just click on that link and sign in. And then um, the last uh, teacher can do here is that uh, the goal is to plan. Um, so either to plan and think about how you'd remix or to actually practice doing that. It's really normal for people here to be on a continuum of comfort levels and experience. Some of you have attended and, and been participating in OER for quite some time and others are fresh and new into it, and that's absolutely okay. So we've designed um, part four to cater and differentiate to you where you're at. And all we ask for you is to just stay engaged because we think you're gonna really appreciate some of the tools and resources that we're about to share with you. So we've talked about the five R's from the beginning. As you recall, one of the goals in the introduction was to share with you that this grant project, we're going to be working with teachers throughout the entirety of the academic year. And we really believe that OER is so much more than just finding a cool resource online and using it in the classroom. It's about engaging with that resource and really thinking about who you are as a teacher, who your students are, and improving it, making it better, making it more customizable or personal. Um, for your local classroom context. And by doing that, that process of learning by doing, it's professional development. I can't say that louder. Um, and again, one of my growth areas and something that I'm targeting this year is trying to communicate that to administrators and make sure that administrators um, are supporting teachers who are engaging in this work. So that's something that's really, really important. And I think teachers need to be supported in that. So um, you can see here on this slide, um, Again, just wanted to highlight here that Remix, we've talked about already retain, reuse, and revise. That was in the third session specifically. Now we're looking at remixing. And as it states here, what it means is the original or revised content, so think of the pathways uh, activity, can be combined with other content to create something new, okay? And we are going to, we have a step-by-step -step activity at the end that's going to guide you through this. So right now, just track and try to understand at a high level, okay, what does remix mean and how does that differentiate between revise? Remix is taking um, multiple uh, resources and recombining them. One thing that's interesting is that we found that, as I alluded to in the earlier session, half of the Pathways community, um, the, the participants as subscribers, indicated that they're already doing this, which is really great. Sometimes we hear fancy words like remix and we think maybe it's you know out of our reach when in, and when in reality, 
Um, we're doing this all the time. We see an activity and we think that's great. This is helping my students, you know, an infor information gap activity. Fantastic. I think I can combine that with this really great interview and um, provide some extra activities or some comprehension checks with an interview that I that I found that I created, et cetera, et cetera. And so remixing isn't um, out of your reach. In fact, I'm going to, if you will permit me, uh, add a little humor. It's post-lunch. It's hard. Workshops are hard. After lunch, I know everybody wants a siesta, but um, hopefully this video it might, might relate with some of you. I've seen Classic, right? Okay, I see you all smiling. Um, this is, you see remixing all the time. This is a classic TikTok remix. Now it's not OER. I mean, well, maybe it is OER. You can correct me. I'm not on TikTok. I'm actually not a, a TikTok savvy user, but I think it's a really great example. We see this all the time with reels on Instagram or social media specifically, where you can really quickly put together a funny video, use music, even use a side-by-side -side video to contrast, right? And so we're constantly bombarded with ways, creative ways people are remixing content. So remixing, um, I shared with you a little bit earlier that I'm currently in Spain on a sabbatical, on a research sabbatical. And one of the things is really important to the Spanish culinary, to the kitchen is the sofrito. Now this isn't unique to Spain. It's really typical for any Mediterranean diet, but it's basically um, any dish that you have, you have to have garlic, onion, celery, uh, carrots, and tomato. It's the base for everything. And that's awesome. Yeah. So frito is really, really important. And I would make a claim that your digital humanities and authentic materials should be your sofrito for any activity you're thinking of. Why? Let's talk about why. So it's the spice, it's the base, it's the most important thing. The reason why is it has a lot to do with what we call intercultural competence. And ACFIL, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, which sets our standards and is our organizing body that unites us across, um, across the US, helps uh, put this uh, into play according to what we call the three Ps, right? So we think of products, practices, that then out of those products and practices that we look at, we can start to engage in thinking about perspectives and not just the target culture's perspective, but also my perspective in my first language and my first culture and how that is different or intersects with the culture and the language that I'm studying. Intercultural competence is so important. It's sometimes if we can think back to the way, at least the way I learned languages in a traditional textbook, how many of you remember when culture was stuffed into the last two pages and there was, you know, we're going to go to this country and you're going to study uh, the money and uh, that they use, the currency that they use, their flag. And these are three really important famous people, right? That's the way culture was traditionally taught. Fortunately, we no longer teach under that uh, mm -hmm. system. And there is so much that we can do to infuse, to provide that sofrito, if you will, for any type of communicative um, activity. And so this is a really, really helpful uh, infographic, actually. And if um, Shannon doesn't mind, thank you. I appreciate you, Shannon, um, responding about TikTok. I have no idea about whether or not TikTok is actually an OER, but it's not. Okay. If you can please drop this link um, for culture, it's a great infographic that you um, that is shared freely. Um, and um, it could be something that you can come back to to reference. But I wanted to remind you that ACFL also shares their intercultural competence can do's. And so this is, um, and I'm gonna make sure to, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you're gonna also get a link. Sorry, I was just navigating my presenter notes here. You will also get 
a link where you can click on these cultural can do's. These are excellent, excellent sites to make sure that you have bookmarked. The first one provides you with the can do statements that are specific to the level that you teach. And the second one is a reflection tool that is specifically specifically um, geared to K through 12. And it's excellent and it shouldn't just be limited to K through 12. The examples that they use are for K through 12 context, but you can absolutely adapt them. But this is really important. It's, a, it's an important starting point because it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of finding authentic materials and things that are you know, shiny and, and neat, but we do it for a very specific pedagogical purpose. And it's always tied to the level of the learner. And it, it, it is in conjunction with the other can-do statements that have to do with communication. So if we think about the five C's, our standards, culture is one of those C's as we know. And so that's what I'm talking about here. I really think that the digital humanities and the authentic material sites that we're gonna share with you are excellent places for you to find freely accessible resources that you can integrate into uh, Pathways existing activity or your other content that you use. We want you to be able to locate these resources so that you can use them um, and you can use them strategically. All right, let's define a couple of things first and I'm gonna define and then share some examples so that it's really clear. What are authentic materials? This is a buzzword in our discipline, right? Authentic resources, authentic materials. And really it means that you are using materials that mimic or are exemplary of real life scenarios. We often used to, to compare them to things that were created just specifically for second language learners. Do you remember, um, oftentimes we would see like accompanying workshop uh, workbooks or uh, textbooks that would have um, illustrations or examples of culture that were clearly written for a second language learner, right? That is not what we would call an authentic material. We would say that that's been adapted or created for principally for a second language learner. It doesn't mean that those are all bad, but it just means that we wouldn't want to only base culture or intercultural competence on those resources. Why? Well, there is so much that happens in ambiguity, in the messiness of what it means to, to exist, right, in a culture, and to have to make sense of symbols and meaning. And so let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. Now, these are some authentic resource examples here. There's a list here of things that you can see. These are pretty typical. They're realia. Again, we're thinking of products. And we're thinking of practices in the, in the language and the cultures that we're teaching and promoting in our classes. And there are two websites that I, I love that I always share whenever I'm doing a professional development workshop. And the first is Lang Media. Lang Media is a repository of videos that specifically are, um, they're organized by the language and the level and even down to the speech act. So you can find a short video of somebody going to purchase something at a supermarket or an outdoor market, for example. And this is a great example of um, an authentic material. It wasn't that somebody was going in there and doing it for a language learning class, right? Um, this is a real person in a real market. And what the, what the archive does is that it glosses those videos and it makes it accessible for learners so that it could be integrated. And there's so much that goes with that. It's just so important for students to see images, right? To see what it actually looks like to buy things in a market where maybe a chicken leg or a chicken is actually hanging, right? Instead of being in a packaged material, that's a maybe a really superficial example, but it is really important to expose our, our learners to, to differences. And to talk about that. Um, the other website that can be really helpful, especially for those of you teaching maybe more of a level three or four or AP or higher ed, is Newsium or Today's Front Pages. And what this does is you can actually explore by region and you can find the region for the language that you teach or the regions rather. And then you can see all of the different newspapers that are published um, in those regions. And they um, every day update the first page of those um, of those uh, 
newspapers. And so what's so great about that is it's just an excellent way to stay up to date on current events. I know in AP, oftentimes um, students have to be prepared to know what is going on in the target, um, in the target culture. And so this would be one way to do that or to to get students used to seeing um, a current events, for example. So these are a couple examples of authentic materials. Later, we're going to share with you a guide that will help you find and access quickly um, authentic materials specifically related to viewing and listening. All right, so let's talk about the digital humanities. We talked about authentic materials and resources. Let's specifically focus in on the digital humanities. So DH sites take collections, okay? So they'll center often on something like history or art, and they will take collections of video, of text, audio, or other artifacts. And what they do is that they transform them, right? They transform them into something that is very accessible for the online viewer. Okay, so you can think of something like an example of um, a really great museum. The Smithsonian is a great example of this, right? If I didn't live in Washington, D.C., it would be a real, real sad day to miss out on getting to see the Smithsonian museums. The Smithsonian does a phenomenal job of archiving and providing virtual reality experiences so that I can actually go to the museum and I can see what it looks like. And actually... I might even be able to explore it better than I would in person. I don't have to wait in line, da, 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 right? So the Smithsonian is one maybe familiar example of what DH or what DH sites or DH projects can do. So we're going to talk to you and show you um, uh, two examples specifically. And I thought it would be fun if, if Amber and I kind of engage in a back and forth so it doesn't feel so presentational for you all. Um, and so I'm going to ask Amber to guide me around this site. So this is the first example we're going to show you, which is um, art is okay. And you can notice here, this is a screenshot that we have here. The link will be provided for you so you can explore it on your own. But I encourage you before you do that to just watch first and experience it. Okay. But you can notice here on the left hand side, it's offered in Spanish, German, Italian and Portuguese. And don't worry, we are going to be modeling uh, another example from an Asian language. And we have an entire repository where we have marked all of the languages um, uh, specific to the DH site. So just, just hold with us for a second. All right. So here we are, Amber. Where should we go? Well, I was thinking it'd be really fun to take a trip to Madrid and maybe we could go on a short stroll. Okay. I think that's the, yeah, that one right there. This one, okay. All right. Let's go on a short stroll. Okay. I've got my, all right. So you can notice here a couple of things, right? So I could change this quickly to Spanish if I wanted to. I could go back to English. Since we are a multilingual uh, community here, I'm going to go back to English, but let's, okay. So I'm going to scroll down. Got some text. And so this is a really wonderful example of digital storytelling, too, because they're combining all kinds of different types of media that we have maps here. So we can see a map of Madrid and we're to help us kind of figure out where we're at. But it's showing us some different things on the map. And then we have historical photographs and illustra illustrations. And then what I think is really cool is that this examines this painting. And then we can look a little bit closer and start to understand what is going on in this very intricate painting, right? There's a lot of different mini scenes almost, right? And so, um, yeah, so what is what is happening with women in, during this time? There's music. I think you just scrolled past some music. Yeah. <laughs> So we can picture what it would be like to be standing by this musical turret. Also, there are glossing features. Let me pause here. So this is another thing that's really impressive about this site is that when there's specific vocabulary or academic vocabulary, you can hover over the words that are highlighted and they've um, defined those or provided more context really a phenomenal, phenomenal site. So this is what we mean about transforming something. You can imagine that if I were studying historical Spain, um, I would have to actually go to Madrid. I'd have to get a pass, show up at the library, ask permission, right? 
it'd be a lot of bureaucracy um, in order to have access, perhaps, you know, a lot of travel time. Um, not everyone had access to these documents. And so um, this is one example where the digital humanities and projects like this do an incredible job of making um, these resources accessible. And what's so incredible about this is that because it's centered, um, we have such a wide array of, of projects that are centered around art and history and culture, they're really, really great for the world language classroom. All right, so I'm gonna come back here. You've got the link to that. Now we're gonna go to a different example. So Amber, all right, let's go here. Stories of clay, and I want you to guide me. And feel free to interrupt me if I don't explain this uh, in depth enough. But this is um, this is one example where you can imagine if you're teaching Korean and you want to talk about the art of of creating uh, products like ceramics, and you want to study what um, what these uh, products or these uh, these pottery pieces look like, um, you can come to this site and and explore. All right, where should we go? So we'll keep going and then I think there's going to be an interactive map. Yeah. And so we can look and see what like the different pieces of pottery look like from different areas, which is pretty neat. So you can hover over those different um, spots. I think you might have to click on them. Yeah, I did. It's a little slow. That's the trouble of the Zoom call. Here we are. Okay. Uh, and then um, uh, past the map, there are different rooms that you can enter. And so you can almost picture this as like a virtual exhibition. And once we enter into the room, we get to learn um, a little bit more about. Um, so what was interesting is that these are actually Koreans that um, ended up in Japan, that they were so many of them were brought to Japan. So there's some um, some really interesting history there along with art. And that's kind of a nice thing, too, about about these digital humanities. Um, websites is that they really combine a bunch of different disciplines, right? So we can, not only can we learn about art, but we can learn about history. We can learn about different cultural aspects. Um, and if you delve further into the website, they explore how these particular artisans really, um, really made, uh, like they set the field up of, of pottery um, up and, and pottery and ceramics up for like the for a very long time that the, the things that they did establish trends and practices that we were still doing to the state, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, so these are just two examples of some beautiful sites where students would have the opportunity to, and I think um, we've, yes, great. Uh, Shannon's dropped that in the chat for you so you can see it. But these are, um, again, these are two examples of DH sites specifically where you can see that interaction is really, really central. So um, what researchers have done, and researchers, I mean that in, in a very inclusive sense. So these are historians, these are librarians, these are um, folks that work in museums, these are curators um, that uh, oftentimes have their own sites or partner with institutions. And they find creative ways to offer up these resources to the public. And what's so important is that they can do this. They, they offer it up to the public for free. So they're openly accessible. And so what we, um, one of the things that we've really realized with the Pathways activities is that while we've done a really good job of setting up a system to help teachers facilitate interpersonal speaking, our next step is to augment those activities with authentic materials. And so that's really where we wanna take you today, okay? So the question is, now that we understand what authentic materials are and digital humanities um, are, what the different types of sites are, some examples, how do we find them? Teachers always tell me, and I, I'm in the same boat when I'm preparing my classes, that it's amazing how quickly 10 minutes of searching for a really cool artifact or um, activity or a, you know, a reality, a piece of media, it can very quickly turn into two hours. We want to help you find the right resource quicker. And so this is on our website. Okay. So you can actually click on our website and you can find these ideas later at a different time. I'm not going to take the time to go over them, but they are going to also be obviously included in this um, Google size presentation. We actually have a, a worksheet for you to follow that takes you through the steps, which is the benefit of being with us here in the workshop is that we're going to take you step-by-step step through this process. Okay. Um, 
And also too, I'm going to include this tutorial uh, for you in a, in just a in just a moment. You if you come back to this Google Slides presentation, I've left it here so that you can access it. But it's actually uh, baked into the activity that you're gonna you're gonna use uh, here in just a moment. Okay. And then these are also some great examples of DH sites. We were working, um, we used Twitter as a way to engage a much larger audience on the internet to try and find DH sites actually um, in uh, your languages to try and help and be more inclusive. But we also really want to encourage you to help us. So maybe you have some, some time you're watching a great show and you just also want to be scrolling. If you find a DH site that you think would be excellent and it's not already on the repository that we're going to share with you here in a minute, we would love to include it. In fact, what we're going to share with you is an editable version of a repository, which means we welcome your input and your exploration as well. But these are just some ways that you could do that on your own. All right. So what we're going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to explain this first and then we're going to go back. Okay. So before you work on your activity, before we go to that 45 minute session where you really get to, you get to sit down with your activity and think about those authentic resources or that DH site, we really want to give you the chance to explore. Exploration is so important because sometimes when we work on an activity, we're still trying to get a sense for what's out there or to understand the materials that we're sharing with you. So that's why we're going to do that in this session now. So I really want to, um, you know, as the language we use as language teachers is lower that effective filter. Um, the goal here is not for you to be an expert. It's for you to get onto this repository, explore it a little bit, and then be able to report back to a couple people what you found. But the more you do that, the practice, um, the easier it'll become when you're thinking about your specific activity. Okay, so we are going to actually put you in breakout rooms at the start this time. Okay, so in just a moment, um, we're going to put you in breakout rooms with three to four people again. And when you're in that room, think of this kind of like a jigsaw activity. Two of the people are going to take on authentic materials and two of the people in the group or one or two people are going to take on DH sites. Why? There's way too much on the spreadsheet for you to possibly be able to scour it in time. And so we're going to divide and conquer. All right. So you need to first assign your roles. The second thing that you're going to do is that once you've assigned those roles is that you're going to take 10 minutes to explore the repository, the Excel spreadsheet or the Google sheet that we're going to share with you on your own. You're just going to click and look at it even in your breakout room. Okay. We're going to tell you, we're going to prompt you once those 10 minutes are up and we're going to say, all right, you've had 10 minutes. Talk about what you found. So you can imagine that you would have clicked on the ceramic site and maybe that art .s or art dash s um, site, and you would say, "Wow, I found something that isn't really great for maybe my language, but it's such a cool, cool site. I'm going to put it on the right. I'm going to comment or something on on the Excel spreadsheet on the um, on the columns. If you are assigned or if you take on digital humanities, you can look in the column." Um, the columns on the spreadsheet under the digital humanities site and column S is notes. So if you, if you find that something is like in particularly, uh, particularly helpful for the, the language and level you teach, go ahead and leave a comment on there. It's editable. Um, and the same for the authentic materials. I'm going to actually show you what the, what the document looks like before, um, putting you in breakout rooms. So just a second. And don't worry, we will share this with you. Just a hot second here. Okay, so this is the um, this is the 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 Google sheet that we um, we will be sharing with you. And so pretty soon here, we expect to see a bunch of your faces here. Um, the table of contents is designed to make your 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 exploration a lot easier. Okay, so let me show you here. So if you are assigned, this is a table of contents, by the way. So if you're assigned, if you say, I want to do digital humanity sites, just click on it and it'll take you to the right tab. Alternatively, you can see below here that we have the tab for digital humanities. If you have this site and you're really curious, let's say your exploration is digital humanities, you can use this in, mul in a multitude of ways. So 
One thing that you can do is you can just look specific to your language. So if you're teaching, I don't know, Latin, then Karen is going to be really excited about this site and she's going to want to go and check it out, right? Um, this is also, though, applicable to French and German. So the same could be true there. All right. So one thing that you can see is we've got this column here. It says these are activities that we may want to integrate this site into. We invite you to help us with that. You don't have to do that right now. But in the future, our goal is our, our team is going to start to fill this out so that we can be strategic in the ways that we're infusing those pathways activities with authentic resources and digital humanities sites. This is that column where you're very much so invited to be able to leave some notes. Okay, what if you're the person who says, well, no, I'm, I'm actually going to be working on the authentic materials and OER projects by language. Perfect. No problem. You're going to just scroll down until you find your language. So I'm going to click on French. And all of a sudden, I come to French. Okay, but oh, no, we don't have any French here. Amber. That's weird. Did I link the wrong we, site? No, but we. Th this is the case for some of our languages. We don't yet have authentic materials. Huh. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually try out those search tips on the very front under table of contents. We pasted those same search tips for you. Huh. You go back to the table of contents. You'll see. Yeah, yeah. I, I got scared there for a second thinking I had mislinked the, the document again. Nope. Okay, perfect. At the very top, there are tips for the finding the authentic materials. And Perfect. so, and, and I imagine you as teachers also have a few have that them. you really like that you can add as well. Which would be great if you can do that. Um, I, um, I'm thinking that it might be helpful if you, so you, I guess there are two approaches that you can take. You can take the approach of adding to this, or if you want to use your exploration time to, to see what's out there, then maybe you, everyone um, sits in the digital humanities sites. It's up to you. We want this to be purposeful for you. But at the end of the day, we're hopeful that this repository gets shared widely and that everybody can contribute together so that we can use these resources and, again, infuse them in the activities. Okay. Thanks, Amber. I appreciate that. So this is, so this is the link. You're, you're going to get this document. You're going to be able to click on this document. And then you're going to be able to talk about what you found. Okay. So if you decided you, that you're gung ho, you have a lot of um, sites that you want to contribute, that's fantastic. And you can add those there and then talk about what you've added in your group. And then there's an optional report out if you'd like to. Um, we're this link, you can um, you can leave us um, a couple. It's it's not a selection or a game or a quiz, it's just answering one question. Um, so feel free to do that. You can answer as many times as you like, just sharing out what you found or maybe one of the DH sites that you liked in particular. All right, so that is um, what we're going to be doing for the next um, 20 minutes. Again, it's an exploration of this um, massive site. We have, I think, over, if I scroll down, yeah, we have over about, oh, I was going to say 120, 119 different digital humanities sites that are linked here. And we, again, have been very, very strategic and linking ones that we think are applicable to teaching world languages and cultures. So there's a lot of exploration to be had and we hope that you're, you're excited to check it out um, and we'll go from there. Okay, I'm gonna admit this other person that's coming in and I think Shannon is working on setting up those breakout rooms for us. If I'm not mistaken, yes. so just let us know when you're ready. Okay, perfect. And I'm gonna go ahead and share out this um, activity. Okay, I can open the rooms now. Perfect. Hold on just a second. Let me make sure that everybody has access to this document. So one second. All right, that's the document. I want to make sure that everybody has access to the instructions. See all of your faces popping in, or I should have said your anonymous animal icon <laughs> off, is popping up. Great. I'm just going to give people a couple minutes to do that because it really, really is essential to being able to do this activity well. <laughs> um, and then once you have that open and access, um, then we can put you in breakout rooms and go from there. I see 24 people, but I know that we have 35 participants on this call, so I'm going to keep waiting. 
And if you need help accessing the document, just send if if sometimes you feel free to send a private message if if you're if you want to, or you can just put it in the chat if you need help. All right. Great. <laughs> Perfect. No software update. Oh good gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, okay. Well, um, go ahead and let's put a people in breakout rooms and we'll go from there. 20 minutes and we'll, we'll keep reminding you when to move to the next step. Okay. You could, should be able to join your rooms now. Thank you for helping with that, Shannon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Holly, I just asked you a question in the chat. Would you be able to provide some clarification before I jump into the breakout room? Totally. So DH sites are absolutely authentic materials, but they're different because oftentimes what they do, so an authentic material might be something like a video or an image or a recipe. A DH site is specifically taking something that would be static or would have to be lived in body and transforming it into an online experience. And my hunch is that most teachers have never experienced D DH, that there isn't a lot of training done with that. And so we um, like the, the Google um, culture and arts that you guys experience. Uh, yeah, like the Boqueria Barcelona Paradas. So that is not a DH site specifically. I, that's that's um, a really great strategy. As as I know, Abby, let me, I mean, let me check it. Um, I can check it out and look at it. Um, but usually digital humanities projects are, um, they're funded through grants and they're projects where researchers or archivists or um, uh, artists are working to try to bring something that is kind of behind a geographical um, boundary uh, to the public in an open way that is transformative. It's experiential. Does that make sense? So it's, yeah, so it's geared towards learners or towards people to have this experience. It's not necessarily something that's just out there for like for the book idea. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Like an authentic mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, and I appreciate the question because maybe when we come back, I can do a better job of clarifying. It's not so important, I think, that to like distinguish between what's a DH and an authentic material. It's just our hunch is that most language teachers know nothing about the digital humanities or don't know how to access them. And they're incredible resources precisely because they're open they're free. So you can see something that in the past was behind, right? Or that like Weezer, for example, you can't necessarily go or your students may never go to DC, to the Smithsonian, but all of a sudden you can take them in a scavenger hunt. You can design something pedagogically so that they can actually feel like they're there. And some would argue have a more authentic experience online because they can maneuver, manipulate it. And the, the, the Mona Lisa, you have to be like, 15 yeah. feet away, whereas online you can get up really close, right? That's an example. Right. And that's what the purpose of bringing people in. Okay. Yes. That helps. And yeah. I think a piece to keep in mind from my librarian brain too, is this stuff yeah. is constantly growing and evolving right now. So having an awareness of it, like you're just going to find more and more that you can use. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you, everybody. I will. You're welcome. Join. Okay. Yay. I'm super curious about this. I mean, this is like a great example. This is Abby's uses a lot with um, her Spanish classes. And I think she actually, I think that she designed an activity. I don't know if it's on pathways, but this is the, the market in Barcelona, right? Where you can hover over. And it's just such a great example of an authentic material, but this mm -hmm. is not a DH project at all. Um, anyways. Well, you know, if the world could agree on their definition of digital humanities, wouldn't that be nice, Kelly? <laughs> I was calling Amber yesterday. I wanted to poke my eyes out with all this is this is this is this is like my oh, little to, to get get lost. Thank you. Thank you for recorded. All right, we've got twenty seconds until the breakout room closes and everyone's back. So we're just gonna wait for that. See if anybody is reported. Can go ahead and refresh this. Okay. 
everybody's tired of Mentimeter. Maybe we've overused Mentees today. That's okay. <laughs> or it just might be that time in the day. Um, okay, got everyone back here. Fantastic. Let's go. Okay. Hold on just a second. All right, everyone should be back. Great to see you. I hope that the exploration phase and then talking with your groups was insightful. Right before we pushed you out into breakout rooms, Abby asked a really great question, which had to do with, yes, exactly that, Andrea. Could we revisit the difference between digital humanities and authentic resources? Thank you. Your questions helped me realize that I, I went too fast or didn't clarify the purpose of separating them out. The, there is a difference and an important difference in understanding open educational resources compared to open access materials, which cannot be editable, but are open, meaning you can, you can use them versus copyrighted materials that you cannot use um, unless you have a subscription or you're part of a system that is paid into that. So there's a very big difference and it's important to know those differences and don't be, uh, don't be too worried. We are going to prioritize that as our first webinar coming this fall. So if you're concerned about that, you can attend that or watch it on demand and you'll come away with that um, equipped to be able to, uh, to, to know very clearly which um, those are. Digital humanities and authentic resources aren't uh, necessarily like crucial for you to say this is DH versus this is authentic. And so, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, Heather, I promise. Um, so I'm what I wanted to show you is actually so um, I'm going to use Abby as example. I don't know if you've seen this. This is specific for Spanish, but this is uh, like a market of uh it's the it's the 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 market in barcelona which if you've ever been able to go to it is super fun and fantastic but they have this really great website where you can hover over and it's really great especially for novice level students because you can see really clearly here that there are things like numbers addresses right simple information with an image but then you can even drill down and you can see um you can see some pictures you can see some really helpful simple uh titles etc cetera, etc cetera. abby's designed actually yeah thank you um abby's designed a really great activity to accompany this maybe she'll she'll want to share it out with you all this is an example of an authentic material. This is not a digital humanities project. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that you can't use it or you can't integrate it. There isn't, the reason why we divided the two up in this presentation was to communicate to you that digital humanities, like we showed you here, if I go back, so if I go back to what we, um, what we had modeled here, right? Stories of play, this is a really good example whereby you would not be able to under you would not be able to see or experience this pottery or see maps like this 20 years ago if you weren't actually in the place where they were archived right you would have to go wait in line get a ticket and go to the museum and that would be a lovely experience but it's not an experience that's accessible to all so what digital humanists do is that they find ways to provide openly those experiences, oftentimes they're very rooted in art, history, right? Things that are deeply important, especially when we think about intercultural competence and artifacts, and they provide those materials in ways that are much more experiential as if the student was transported in time to be able to engage with that piece of art, right? And to be able to use, it also too is, you can imagine one of the things that's really, oops, sorry, if I were to go back into the site, do you remember when we were, I was showing you the glossing features, like you could hover over a term and then it would open up and it would tell you more about the term. That's not something that happens in, if you think like a textbook that's going over art, for example, there's a, there's a page, right? A digital, an actual printed copy. You can't hover over that word. You'd have to go find a dictionary and maybe the dictionary would just provide a very basic definition. These glossing techniques are very important for DH sites because what they do is that they promote 
deeper ways of knowing and understanding, not just its definition, but also its cultural and historical relevance. And so um, a digital humanities project at its best immerses you in the thing that they're trying to show you, whether it be art, again, history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also uh, pointed out uh, earlier on that OER Commons, uh, one of the things that you all said that was really great was Google Art and Culture. That page is a really good example of, of the, 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 the intersection between authentic materials and digital humanities, because here you can all of a sudden, you can play, you can experience augmented reality, you can take a tour, you can create something, right? There is a maybe too many options on there. Um, you could spend in a lifetime engaging with all of the new projects that they're promoting. But sometimes as language teachers, we forget that these, these sites exist or we don't know about them. And they might be the thing that is, is exciting to you. You might say, I'm just going to work with one or two DH sites and I'm going to let my students explore them and they're going to get to explore um, and, and, adventure with the language in ways that they wouldn't be able to do, um, you know, traditionally without going to the place. So that's, does that help explain the difference between a digital humanities site is a site where these are often uh, grant, granted projects where, again, researchers in conjunction with archivists, curators, right, um, folks that work at um, museums, librarians work together and try to think through providing an experience um, where something that was analog all of a sudden is digital, immersive, interactive, um, and high quality. Um, authentic materials can be everything from a TikTok video to a meme to a recipe you find online, okay? And so, um, and we're, we're more well-versed in being able to find authentic materials, although as you can see from our spreadsheet, we're deeply lacking um, in your expertise to find the right authentic materials, uh, the ones that you love and you like, and this is going to be a huge resource that again, will be open and accessible to teachers across the U.S., across the globe who are accessing our materials. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to skip over this. We're going to go back to where we were. Hold on just a second. Okay, so the question now is, okay, great. So we've seen what DH is and we've seen authentic materials and we know that the reason why we, we should care about this is because intercultural competence is one of our core standards. And we also know that textbooks, traditional textbooks just can never be up to date um, and can never be rep representative or uh, can never provide the, the representation or the diverse ways of knowing and being out in the world. And the internet has completely changed that for us as language teachers. But there still is a pedagogical element here. It's not enough to just say, look, I found a really fancy website or I found a really cool material. The hard work and the place where we infuse our expertise as language teachers is precisely in the ways we think about the pre-activities that help our students engage with these sites, the during activities that might help our students um, explore those sites and make sense of those sites, and then those post-activities that help students actually think and reflect on the materials that we've used. This is a thing link, this is a static picture, but I'm gonna show you right now. And you'll have access to this in the guide that we're gonna provide for you. And I see a lot of discussion here in the chat, which is great. Um, but what I wanna show you right now is that this is this is for you, you'll have this. This is just like a really quick thing link, um, used to be free. Now they only let you freely edit too. Um, so I, I chose wisely. This is a toolkit or this is a, um, a resource that I use in a lot of, um, in, in my courses for, I'm a teacher educator, so I uh, actually teach our methods um, courses for our pre-service teachers at Boise State, um, for those of you that don't know me. And so this is one of the resources that I created for them that I thought could be applicable and helpful to you all as well today. Doesn't mean that these are the only before activities. We saw the logo graphic clues earlier, right? Where you could pick, let's say that you're going to use um, you're going to actually use the uh, the Prado, the um, 
the immersive experience of looking at, at historically what uh, what the Capitol used to look like. Um, and you want your students to go in there and maybe explore an element of it. You could think of a couple pictures, right? Just as I did at the beginning of our session today, earlier this morning, and you could ask students to anticipate what they think that they're gonna be exploring based on images. So that's one technique of a pre-activity. If you hover over these, you'll be able to see just a really nice summary. I think most of these are going to be um, pretty familiar to you as a language teacher. Nonetheless, it's helpful to have them in front. And so um, the other thing I wanted to remind you is that there are actual um, graphic organizers. Actually, they're, um, they're from the Carla website that are really, really useful. And Actful has hosted them on their website and they're, they're accessible to you and you can edit them. They're OER um, from Carla because Carla is a national language resource center. And in the spirit of all and all LRCs, activities and resources are shared openly with language teachers. In fact, if you've never heard of an LRC, um, you should check them out because there is so much offered to language teachers um, just by exploring that site alone. But these graphic organizers are excellent tools to be able to help students make sense of a site that you're asking them to explore. So you're going to get to um, have access to this as you think about how you'll remix an authentic material or a digital humanities site. These are some guiding principles that hopefully will help help you think about why um, again, authentic materials and digital humanities projects are so important. Um, again, it reflects a commitment to diverse voices and perspectives by being able to represent multilingual, multicultural communities um, in a more equitable way. Second, it's a way to integrate, right, more intercultural competence, which is something that oftentimes, um, at least in historically in language teaching, has kind of been an add-on or something that you get to at the end of a unit. Instead, we're thinking about how it's constantly integrated into what we're doing. These resources are fantastic opportunities for more comprehensible input, and this can really help aid your students in that preparatory cycle as they prepare to do the interpersonal speaking pathways activity, for example. And I'll show you what that might look like on the next slide. Um, I also firmly believe that the art of finding and using a uh, digital humanities or authentic material is a really great way for us as language teachers to continue being involved learners. I, I, there's no way that I am an expert, especially in Spanish with 21 different speaking, right? 21 different countries that I could ever, ever feel like I've arrived and uh, understand all of the cultural nuance. And so I'm constantly trying to find ways to norm and learn. Um, and this is this is an invitation for us as, as language teachers, I think, for that important content professional development as well. So when you think about the Pathways Project Activity, which we spent parts one, two, and three really looking at, think of that a little bit like your destination, right? We know the output, speaking output specifically, is more challenging. We wouldn't ever, ever, ever argue that we should start with speaking, right? We know that in a new unit, the goal is that eventually we would be able to give our students enough exposure and frequent um, practice so that they would get to a point where they could use their language, whether in writing or in speaking. So we've talked about those pathways project activities. You've, you've seen one that you're, you're currently revising so now you might think about, well, what's a, what's a step before that? What's, what are some materials, um, what are some sites that could help my student think about the topic and what are some activities that I can create to help them engage with those resources so that they're ready to actually use that language with one another? Does that make sense? how the two can feed off of each other. So um, some of you might be familiar with the integrated performance assessment. I tease that it's IPA, different type of IPA, not the, not the beverage, right? Um, the IPA, the integrated performance assessment is a really useful tool to think about a cycle of teaching where there's an interpretive phase, 
an interpersonal phase followed by a presentational phase. Obviously for the confines of this workshop, we don't have enough time to go into that. But what I'm presenting to you today is a shortened abbreviated version of that. So here you can see or think of these digital humanities or authentic materials sites as that interpretive opportunity. Your students are gonna get to see something and you're gonna guide their interpretation, the meaning of those sites. And you're gonna do that through your expertise as an educator to design activities. They don't have to be massive activities. It could be something like a logographic flu with a couple images, right? What do you think is the connection between these images? Ah, well, well we're gonna actually look and explore La Boqueria in Barcelona and you're gonna get the chance to go and, and see what's being sold at this market. Okay, so they don't have to be elaborate activities, but you're going to think through, okay, as I'm trying to remix a pathways activity with uh, an authentic material, that can be a really meaningful way to provide interpretive communication um, to your students that prepares them to be able to then speak about it. So you're going to get the next uh, 45 minutes um, to be able to, 45 minutes to be able to work on your activity. And I want to explain to you, um, oops, sorry, don't check your email, not yet. I expect, uh, put this uh, too, uh, too far. Hold on just a second. I'm going to grab the link. Yeah, here it is. I don't know if it's already been shared. Sorry, I can't see very far. There we go. All right, here is the link. So it should take you to um, this document where it says, would you like to make a copy? Same as before. And you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna make a copy. And then I'm gonna open it up and guide you through it before we um, set you loose to, to work on this. It wants you to request access. I get the same thing, yeah. Okay, all right. Let me let me see here. Ah, my apologies. I know what. Yep, it's because it's restricted. Sorry. Okay, let's go ahead and send that link out again, or click on the link again and see if that works. Let me know if it did the trick. No, Kelly. I think I try again. I just went to the root document. I think you're on a copy of it. Try, oh, to, try right. refreshing now. Right, see right. if that works. Okay. You're right. Yep. Just a second. That works okay. now. Does that work now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you should be able to make a copy of this. Okay. And so you can see that this, it says copy up here. If you wanted to, you could put your name in the first part. So you know that it's, you're working in your version. I like to do that or recommend doing that just so that you can avoid the mistake that I just made. Um, and you just know that this is your document to work in. And there are a couple of things that I think are gonna help you as you, you work on this final part. It's still not working for you. Is it working for other people? Yeah? Okay, maybe um, Shannon or Amber can work with Mercedes um, to, to be able to troubleshoot that um, while I'm explaining this. So you're going to want to be able to, um, to open up as well the, the part three, let's revise. One way that you can, and you want to make sure that you grab your copy that you've been revising. It's probably still open in your window. If not, one thing that you can do is you can go to um, Google Drive and just put in this part and you can search for it and find it um, quick, quickly that way. Okay. But you're going to want to be able to come back. Um, you're going to be able to want to come back to this document and, and access it eventually. Remember when we were talking about how to find authentic interpretive reading and listening artifacts? This is that document and it's going to be really helpful in giving you some some starting points. So if you were on this, um, if you were on the, the repository and you're looking, for example, in Basque and you said, OK, um, this is great. There's this Wikipedia site, but I want to I, I want to actually find and contribute um, here, then you would be able to use this document to do that. OK, 
So these are just some helpful ways to get started looking at blogs, blogs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So this is, again, these are just tools that are going to guide you in your, in your workshop time, your strategic workshop time. This is that link that I just mentioned or just showed you. This is that thing link. Okay. You have access to it now. And then, as I mentioned earlier, those graphic organizers that are now hosted actually on the actual um, site, they're available to you. I love these because if I scroll down, you can actually find a graphic organizer that fits your goal, your pedagogical goal. So if you want to work, let's say you want um, your students to actually explore a DH site related to a timeline, maybe it's about um, archiving some type of uh, historical right element of a region or a moment, you could use one of these Google You'll also see um, that there is a PowerPoint option for those of you that work in Teams or a Google option. And so you could click on this and what it's gonna do as you just saw is it's gonna ask to, it's gonna allow me to make a copy. And so I'm gonna actually be able to revise the graphic organizer, which is really, really helpful so that I can tweak it to what I wanna do, right? So this is this can be a helpful tool. So these are just, this is a list of resources that can aid you in this time, okay? This is a copy of what I just talked about, about why it's important to remix and important to integrate that intercultural competence piece. And I just covered this as well. Okay, so when you're ready to remix, okay? So if this really excites you, like I know, I know many of you on this call, and I'm going to pick on Andrea. Andrea loves music so much. It's her thing. And so I know that Andrea is probably pretty jazzed about finding some music or elements with art. I mean, look at her background. She can wave. You can see she's got a really nice Zoom background that's actually real. Um, and so she might be really enthused about finding some authentic materials or exploring the DH site centered around music or art, for example. So she might be ready to remix. But if you're feeling like this is too fast and you just want to center on revising the pathways activity, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so you need to you need to be okay with where you're at. We are not driving or pushing you to have to remix. We're offering it. So this is that part where you you get to differentiate about your comfort level for today. What we do want you to do, however, is we want you to go to the um, we want you to go to the first um, activity, which I don't have open, just a second. Actually, can you drop the original activity, um, Amber, which is the one, um, part three in the chat for us? Thank you. And then I'll show you what I'm referring to so that you can find it. All right, there it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up. You've already made a copy of this and you've already revised it um, or you've already started working on it. I just want to show you where you're going to go. OK, so you should have already I see all of you coming in here, but you don't need to do anything with this document. OK, because you already have a version of it where you've been working. Um, so I just want to show you, though, you will have already written here, hopefully. In the last session, you were jotting down some ideas or some places where you want to revise. I had a really great conversation with Karen earlier about something that she wants to add to one of the activities. And so she was jotting down some, some ideas here. So you could either continue to work with steps one through five and polish those or really articulate how you want to revise the activity or, or go into OER Commons and hit the revise button and make those changes. You can use your 45 minutes that way. If you feel like you're ready and you want to remix in addition, then that's where you'll you'll start. You'll start here at step six. Does that make sense? So it's, it's up to you. You can go back and work steps one through five, or you can say, nope, I, I'm, I'm jazzed by these authentic materials. I kind of want to, I want to see what I can come up with. You choose, you do you, um, you choose what you want to do. These are some guiding questions that can help you think about what you might want to look for. 
And then um, this is a way for you to brainstorm. Okay, so this is a graphic organizer, a pedagogical graphic organizer that we have created for you. And so you're gonna, you, you can work on this and start contributing to this. We'll, we're gonna be very accessible to help. Um, we're gonna uh, move out into breakout rooms again. Everybody will stay here, but as you need help, um, the help doesn't have to just be technological. It can also be bouncing off an idea you have or trying to think through what, what could work. That's, um, we, that's what we wanna, that's what we're here for. The final step, and we'll give you, we'll give you time to be able to do this. So we'll tell you once the 45 minutes is up and we wanna move you to turning it in. Um, turning it in, you've already shared your document with us. Amber had you do that in the previous session. So now is a question when, at the, when it's all said and done is whether or not you want it to actually, um, to actually have it hosted on, on the Pathways repository. And we would, we would love that we would really be jazzed to see uh, to see that grow. But we also recognize that you might not be there yet or you might wanna think about it a little bit more. So this isn't a forced share. We, we're just glad you're here. Um, but if you do want to share and engage with us, you can fill this out. Again, we already have access to this document. So we'll be able to come back in and we'll be able to respect and see how you've responded. So if you're willing to share these ideas here Okay, so let's say you didn't actually go on the OER Commons and actually remix the activity yet, but you have these ideas in this document and you'd like to partner with us to see those put into, into practice, then you would answer yes, and then you would also put your email here, okay? This just helps us know and then what our OER editor team can get in touch with you. And we can work together to take what you found and your ideas and put them into fruition. You'll be credited for it. Your name would appear um, as one of the Pathways contributors and you'd be able to see your activity remixed and, and augmented on the OER Commons. So these are just some steps for you if you'd like to do that. Again, we wanna reiterate that it doesn't have to be, you've seen a lot of the activities in their finished state as a product, right? On OER Commons today, you got to explore them. If you're, idea of a remix isn't yet there, that's okay. You can still fill this out with some ideas and some starting points. We want your starting points. We, we oftentimes don't, that redistribution um, phase, as you can see here, only 10% of our community actually shares back. And that 10% is like a couple instructors who really have done this a lot. So we really want to change that. And we want to invite more people to feel like they can share their, their work back. Um, no, sharing your work is not a requirement for the credit, but we are just asking you to have shared this document so that we can, we have evidence, right? For the PD, we have to, we have to show um, Boise State's professional development office and keep track of the, the assignments, but no, no, we are going to honor what you feel comfortable with. And, um, and that's why we've asked you to do this. But again, we're going to give you 45 minutes to do either step six or go back and finish steps one through five. And then we're gonna tell you, okay, we're gonna wrap it up and please go ahead and fill in that final step box so that your um, preference is clearly stated and everybody gets the chance to do that. Does that sound good? And stick with us because um, this is the part where teachers say that they need the time. And I know it's starting, it's like after lunch, but stick with it really while things are fresh and you're in the moment, use the 45 minutes to finish an activity that can benefit you. This is the PD, it's that process that you're engaging in. And if I can present a little carrot, we have two more raffles to give out. And then we'll also talk- I know you wanna hear the other songs on yeah, the Yeah, yeah, the other songs. <laughs> um, and then we also wanna to talk to you about um, a couple upcoming events, all right? And make sure that you, we ha now have a social media presence um, specific for the Pathways Project. So you want to make sure that you're following all of that, you're subscribed, you're in the know. So we'll, we'll, we'll do some uh, of those house cleaning um, elements afterwards. And the most important part is that survey. So track with us, but we're going to go ahead and um, Shannon's going to move the facilitators into breakout rooms right now for me. You all have, um, you all should have up your version of your part three, okay, that you've been editing. 
And then also this new one, excuse me, I can't see it here. Yeah, this new one that you just made a copy of, okay, that'll guide you through how you could do the step six remixing if that's how you want to spend your time today. But 45 minutes, just get to do a nice strategic working time. I hope that that is helpful to you. I'm going to stop talking and um, I will be managing the chat. So as you need help, again, it doesn't have to just be technological. It can be pedagogical um, and we'll get you to the right person. And we're going to interrupt you a little bit and I'm going to, our, my timer got messed up when I was um, navigating between a couple slides. I know that I gave you less time than I promised and I'm sorry about that. I think my, um, my brain got a little confused with the time change. So I want to make sure that we get you to the next steps and that you know um, you know what to do and how to stay informed on opportunities. Does that sound good? Um, before we do that though, I do I am going to ask that you at this time check your email and if you can um, go to your email, there is a link to fill out a survey. Okay, so if you can go ahead and fill out that survey for us, that would be most appreciated. We're going to give you about, um, about eight minutes to start it and then wrap up with some announcements. Um, we might go five minutes over. I'm sorry in advance. It would help just to see a thumbs up so we know how people are um, advancing with the survey. Fantastic. Thank you all. Great. All right. You can continue to fill that out, but in an interest of time, we're going to um, remind you of a, or let you know about a few things. The first is that there are going to be fall webinars dedicated to these themes. So you're going to want to look for that. We're going to be announcing the dates uh, very soon here. Um, one of the best ways to stay in touch with how to join those webinars is to make sure that you are getting our newsletter. So Shannon, if you um, don't mind popping that uh, link in the chat for people, um, most of you are probably already subscribed to our newsletter. Nonetheless, we want to make sure that you're getting, uh, you're getting information in a timely manner. The other thing that we wanted to let you know is that we are on social media. Um, Instagram, we had a, a, we ran into an issue uh, today, although it looks like our account is, you can see it. I don't know, Amber, if you want to. Oh, it's Twitter. It's Twitter. I felt, Twitter. I, I felt uh, very much Twitter. like I was being treated like the former president for a moment because okay. it's like I, I logged in and it's like, you have broke the rules of Twitter. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Well, We're locked out for um, a week, but that's okay. fine. Um, I, I imagine bummer. most folks are, are, are Instagram users. Yeah. Um, so, so um, this is, uh, for, so first, first of all, uh, again, here's that link for the, the newsletter to stay up to date, but you can also, um, Shannon will put in the chat here, I think, um, the link that you can join to follow us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, we're working on a Facebook page, and then we'll get back up and running with Twitter. That's hilarious. Can't <laughs> win today. Um, <laughs> and then we wanted to also ask if you found today to be helpful to you, or you liked what you saw a post or a shout out on social media. We, the survey that we conducted back in June was really telling the majority of pathways, um, subscribers, uh, found out about OER from a colleague or from social media that those are the two most effective ways to get the word out there. So you can really help us today by promoting, um, promoting this work and the value of OER. Um, you can tag us, um, Amber, do you mind putting in our tag? Um, there are multiple ways to tag us in a post. Um, but it's also too really helpful if you can share something uh, with a friend and we actually drafted. So like an email, a basic email, we drafted a script of an email for you. So I think that can also be posted in chat. I lost my chat box. Okay, so there's lots of things here. There's a newsletter, there's Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And then um, Shannon, I don't know if, if you have access to the email template as well, which is a Google doc. We'll drop that in the link there um, too. 
yep, there's the draft of an email template. So if you wanted to just really quickly share this out with a couple of your friends, your language teaching friends, this would be super helpful. We would love to get the word out there and grow participation um, and grow uh, opportunities for uh, teachers to contribute. And we don't want to waste your time drafting it. So we did it for you. You just need to put your name, the person's name here, your name and send it off. You can copy and paste that and we would be very grateful. Um, we also want to make sure that you know, I jumped over this and I didn't mean to, there are loads of PD opportunities for Idaho. Danielle, you're on the call here. If you want to wave, she's our IATLC president and has been planning for months years really um, for a very robust uh, program this year for IATLC. We're gonna be um, in the South and we're gonna be in the North in the spring. And so there are gonna be multiple ways for people to engage. So definitely check that out if you can. Um, and then finally, let's go ahead and raffle off some of those prizes.